All right. Welcome to the June 16th, 2020 Club Cubase Google Hangout. My name is Greg Undo. We'll be uh, getting started here in just a couple of minutes. Let me just make sure I have my audio going through. My feed is working as expected on my monitoring computer. And I'm just going to do, do a quick test. Okay, so um, if you haven't been attended a Club Cubase Google Hangout, um, you could submit questions in advance or you could uh, just enter your questions in the comments field. I'm going to turn my phone volume down here. Uh, so if you want to send questions in advance, you could send them to clubcubase at steinberg.de. Um, we will have the index, hopefully we'll have the index done tonight of all the questions and topics asked today. So we could, you could quickly refer back to different, uh, topics that we covered. And if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us where you're from, um, you could, uh, introduce yourself in a comments field. And as you have questions, we will, uh, you can enter them in the comments field. We will try to go through the questions as completely and succinctly as possible. It'll probably go in pretty much chronological order for the questions asked in the chat area. So um, it doesn't help if you ask the same question repeatedly over and over again. All it does is kind of clog up the discussion feed. So if we can try to shy away from that, it would be appreciated. That way I don't have to kind of read the same question over and over again and we get through more topics quickly. Uh, like many of you during the health crisis, my family is at home, so you may hear my wife upstairs working. She's directly above me, so you may hear her in the microphone. My son is also home, so I may have to switch out a, during, usually during the Google Hangouts, he's watching a Disney or National Geographic show, so uh, we will probably be interrupted so I could get a new uh, show started for him. So, but we'll let people get logged in. If you're watching this live, uh, we'll get started in a few minutes. If you are watching this after the fact, uh, we will, uh, you may want to skip ahead to eight or 10 minutes, uh, and then we'll probably get started uh, around that time after we get people logged in. So let's go ahead and see who's kind of logged in here. All right, so we have Denmark. We have Roger Hooper from Maryland. Good, good to uh, got to catch up with Roger on the phone last night. We have Pablo from Spain. All right, all right. So we have uh, Sir Robert from Atlanta. Looks like he's getting the window across grade. Okay. Um. Okay, so we have Germany. We have Buenos Aires. Pine Grove, Pennsylvania, Norway, the UAE. I have a good friend that lives in Abu Dhabi, or former nanny, and one of my son's best friends from when they were babies. I live in Abu Dhabi now. Okay, so we have Norway. Okay, so I just see a question. Uh, what is the microphone for song? Maybe if you could uh, maybe expand upon that question, that'd be great. Okay, so seeing, uh, all right, so we have Fort Wayne, Indiana. All right, so we have Sweden. Soren, I think he's been on a number of the different hangouts. Right, so we have Chicago, Illinois. Okay, so. Okay, we have Jan from Stockholm. Okay, so just seeing question on scrolling, converting quad groups. OK, 
Okay, so we see, um, all right, South Korea. It's probably very late there, very early. All right, so we have Montrose, Pennsylvania. All right. All right, so we have Germany, we have Prague, Czech Republic, New Mexico. All right, so we have Austria, Germany, India. Okay, so we got a question on comping. All right, so we have Millard Brown from Pennsylvania. We have Dennis in New York City. Tucson, Seattle. All right, you have North Boston, New York. We have Asheville. It's a beautiful city. One of my first business trips, I got to go to Asheville. Okay, so we have Israel. Seattle. All right, so we have the East Pole. Someone else from Arizona. Okay, we'll get started here in just a couple minutes. We have more people getting logged in. All right, so we have Nebraska, United States. All right, so India, France, Berkshire, England. Okay, we'll just be waiting a couple minutes. I see a question on Wave Lab. And there's a couple of things. There is a Nuendo promotion currently going on if you're not familiar with that. So if Nuendo is something you wanted to uh, partake in, you could do that. Um, there's also going to be a uh, Spectral Layers hangout tomorrow. So if you, you want to look on the Steinberg channel for that, we can uh, go you know, check out the Spectral Layers. All right, so we have Long Beach, New York. All right, we have Dusseldorf, Portugal, Switzerland. Okay, we'll just maybe get started in our two minutes, getting people, more people getting logged in. Okay, we'll just sing some questions on guitar parts. We'll get to that. Okay, we'll have more people getting logged in. We'll get started here in just a few minutes. And for those people, we've had a lot of people ask uh, when, uh, you know, Cubasis for Android will be available. That started shipping this week as of yesterday. I see Millard mentioning that as well. So if you're an Android user, like, you know, kind of an Android user for my phone, so I'm looking forward to getting a copy of it. Okay, so we see from Ralph about using uh, Cubase Live. So I got your question, so we'll get to that today. Okay, so we have Nepal. Okay, maybe in our 30 seconds or so, then we'll get started. Okay, so we have a lot of guitar-oriented questions today. That's great. Uh, so quick question I see, is there Cubase on iPhone? There is a Cubasis uh, that will work on iOS, including your iPhone. So yeah, you could run that. So you can get it at the App Store.
Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. I think we had a question or two that were submitted before the Hangout, and I captured them this time so we didn't lose them. Um, so uh, question, uh, Greg, hope you're doing well. How do I sync and run MIDI out from Cubase 10.5 to hardware Korg M1? And can I send audio out from M1 to audio input on my Yamaha UR22? So it's actually a Steinberg UR22, but yeah, we can do that. So what you want to do is if you need to synchronize the sequencers between Cubase and like the internal sequencer in the M1, you'd go to your studio setup uh, and go or go to your, your transport menu and we would choose our project synchronization setup. So you'd probably want to send MIDI timecode or MIDI clock. Uh, you could click on destination. So you could probably send MIDI clock to out of your UR22. So I have a, a, like a UR24C. So I would just send that uh, and activate. You want to make sure that you activate external sync if you're uh, using the internal sequencer in the M1. And then you could actually just synchronize the two sequencers or transmit and record the MIDI data as a MIDI track. So if we add a MIDI track and you set the input from your, uh, we'll say like your UR22. So at this point you could set your input and just record that. And if you wanted to, you could also, you know, just take the audio outputs of your Korg M1 and just connect that directly to your UR22. So if you wanted to hit play, you could record both the MIDI and add a stereo audio track. So we'll just say, uh, I want to add a stereo audio track. Um, and then you could record both the MIDI from the M1 and the audio simultaneously through that. Uh, if you have the Cubase Pro, you could also set it up. If you go to your audio connections under studio and you could set up your Korg M1 as an external instrument. So we would just say, you wanna add external instrument. Um, we'll give it a name. And then once we, you want to define the inputs from your uh, UR22 here. And then when you go to play back the chord, you could add a MIDI track. And then at this point, you could just choose to route this or if you even wanted to treat it like a VST, you could say, I want to add an instrument track and go to external plugins. And then you could just choose your Korg M1 and then that would automatically route the audio directly back in. So there's a number of ways of getting your data. So if it's just, you know, playing, you know, if you just wanted to access the sounds in the M1, you don't need to set up the synchronization, but if you wanted to set up uh, and transfer from the sequencer, you could do that, but make sure that you go to your transport to the project synchronization setup uh, and that you send your destination here. Um, and then you could send either MIDI timecode or MIDI clock to the Korg, have that sync, and then you should be able to transfer back uh, quite easily. So give that a shot. All right, let's go through some more questions. Okay. Okay, so we see, uh, hi Greg, question, hope all is well. Yeah, we're doing great, thank you for asking. Uh, so I'm just wondering, how do you get rid of that quiet hiss when you get amps when you record electric guitars, thanks. So a lot of times you may, let's see if I have um, some hiss here, I probably do on some of these guitar parts before they record. So let's just solo a guitar part here. So if we kind of look at just this one particular section, I'll just repeat this. I'll, I'll just grab my, put it in my range tool and I'll hit the letter P and then I'll just kind of loop this. So really a lot of times what you do is just kind of, you know, notch out particular frequencies. You could do that. A lot of people will use a noise gate. So if you get to your channel strip, like, and if you have just noise, like that's constantly going on. Uh, what you could do is just have a noise gate. 
And then when the track before it hits a particular threshold that you set here, um, the track will just be silent until it hits a threshold. So while it's just the hiss isolated by itself, we could choose to just kind of set the threshold accordingly here for both tracks. So if I just wanted to look at this particular track, we could turn on the noise gate. And while we have just that isolated bit of noise, But often, just kind of looking at the EQ, you can kind of nudge out that bit. Now, when you do a noise gate, what it's going to do actually is, you know, as soon as it reaches a threshold, you still hear the noise, but obvious, but um, it may not be as apparent. You could get more sophisticated and get, you know, different noise reduction plugins or run it into something like WaveLab where it could do an analysis of the noise, but sometimes that may have adverse effects on the tone of the guitar so i would try doing like a noise gate or just you know doing just some edits where the guitar amp itself was perhaps you know just isolated before the guitar and often when a guitar part is going on you may not notice such a huge difference uh so as you're kind of playing along there could be noise on a guitar but that's often part of the tone of the guitar itself um so you know and sometimes so if it's just like you know before the guitar part comes in you have a lot of noise try noise gate or just to edit it out and generally that works best but sometimes you know guitar players can only get to tone when their amps are cranked up to be you know incredibly loud and you know you're kind of fighting sometimes with that uh, but you can have a noise floor so try gating or editing Okay, so I see a question. What is the microphone for song? So, um, so I'm not sure if this is a, a basic question, but you know, maybe it'll be expanded upon later. But you know, the microphone will capture different sounds like your voice, a saxophone recording, or you know, a guitar amp. You know, you put a microphone that can be captured and recorded through an audio interface, and that will digitize it into Cubase that you can see this. So, if you want to record you know, drums or a guitar amp, you need a microphone for that. Okay. Okay, so a question, uh, is there a way to have Groove Agent add samples being used to the pool so they won't go missing when you move project to another computer? So if you have uh, a Groove Agent instance here, so let's say I will open up uh, an instance, a groove agent, and I'll just cut the kit here so I don't have any samples. Um, and I wanted to preserve, you know, what I could do is, let's say if I would, if I had built my own samples, hang on, my son is knocking. I may have to switch TV shows, bear with me. All right, so I'm back. All right, so. <clears throat> All 
All right, so uh, getting back to our question, is there a way to have Groove Agent and samples being used uh, to the pool so they won't go missing when you move project to another computer? So, you know, if you've dragged samples and kind of created your own Groove Agent kit, you know, so let's say if I want to come here and I have these samples I could drag and I've now made my own kit like this what I would do uh, you know if the if you have the samples in the, in the project itself um, it'll be saved with the pool but if you wanted to you could right click and just choose to <clears throat> export kit with samples <clears throat> and you could save it to any location that you want to so you could even save it directly into your project folder if you wanted to do that so I know a lot of people We'll take all their Groove Agent samples for a project and all of their samples for Halion if they've done custom samples and just save it within the project folder. So, so once you have it set up in Groove Agent, just right click on the agent itself and just do export kit with samples. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so I just see a question I need uh, made song start from zero. How can I do that? So when you start a project, you'll see new project. Um, I like to choose here to choose prompt for project location. And we could choose a folder where we want all of our files to be saved to. At this point, we could add like an instrument track if we wanted to start with drums we could start off with like a groove agent. If I wanted to record a guitar, I could click on add audio track. I choose where, what audio input of my interface that it's connected to here and how I want to hear it. And then you could just record MIDI information, you know, so if I wanted to record MIDI information from a keyboard controller or have groove agent play back different sounds for me and then record uh, you know, my different parts, uh, and then you could choose to edit and mix as you kind of go through the process, but that's how you could kind of get a song started from the beginning. Okay. So we see, is it possible to scroll the last track of a project to the middle of the screen? Um, Let's see if I, I'm not sure if this is meant to be vertically or horizontally. Um, so let me just open up kind of a large project here. So we can take a look at it. All right, so let's say I have a lot of different projects here. So, you know, if you go, let's say you want the last, um, to scroll the last track of the project to the middle of the screen. So this is kind of the last project here. So as I kind of just use my scroll wheel uh, up and down, I could kind of see all of my different parts. It may not be exactly to the middle of the screen, but it's going to be visible. Uh, perhaps if I shut my lower zone off, it doesn't seem to make a difference. Uh, but if you mean for that to be kind of uh, vertical orientation, so it's not going to go directly to the middle screen, you could just come here and adjust this slider to the right here. Um, if you want to see you know, the middle of the screen also, just in case I'm totally misunderstanding this, you could also have different scrolling options. So if I'm playing along here, we could go to our scroll options and we could put it into like a stationary cursor. So now we could have the middle of the project kind of always continually scrolling if you wanted to. 
So that way that's always in the middle of the screen. But so I'm not absolutely sure if it's kind of vertical or horizontal. Um, but you could just kind of use the mouse scroll wheel to go all the way down to the bottom project, but it may not, not take it directly to the middle of the screen. Okay, uh, Greg, is there any way to convert quad groups to stereo groups? I need to deliver stereo stems, but I write in quad. Easiest way to do this, you know, check out um, if you go to your down mix presets. So let's say if you are writing in quad, I'll just come over here. Uh, and I'll make a, you know, it, and if you have it set up for quad, I'll just delete this monitor for now and I'll add a monitor. Let's make it a quad. So, you know, what you could do is just simply come over here and if it's, and you could see the different down mix presets from mono to stereo. Also, if you need to do this, you could choose to like on your master output, there's a plugin. So you could just run it. Um, like mix six to two. So this way you could actually, um, you know, go from quad to, you know, stereo. So you could do your down mix presets there. So those are the two options. So I would maybe just on the master effects, uh, try the mix six to two plugin. And that should allow you to kind of do down mix presets for that. So you can take your stereo or you take your quad to stereo quite easily. Okay, it says, uh, I'm recording from old tapes into Nuendo. The tape plays at wrong speed. Is there an easy way to adjust the speed in Nuendo and Cubase? So let's come over here. And I think I have a project that may show this. Okay, so what I'm going to do is to select the file. So let's say if we're here. I'll make this my active project first, that would help. Okay, and let me go to my control room, make sure we're going out the right speaker. So let me check the output here quickly. Okay, so let's say if I have a two track recording. I'll just try a new project here real quick. I think I may have. Okay, so if we have to do like a very speed where maybe like the original tape speed wasn't the original recording or the tape machine wasn't playing back at the right speed, what you could do is select a file and then you'll see under, you know, you'll see an algorithm here. Uh, we want to choose this to be Elastic and one of the tape algorithms. So let's say I just want to do Elastic Pro Tape. So now as I change the, because if it's played back at the wrong speed from tape, what's, what it's going to do is play back the wrong pitch as well as the wrong tempo. So now that I have this in um, tape machine mode, what we could do is I could just adjust the tempo up And I'll just put this into musical mode. 
And now as I speed up the pitch and the speed of the recording will just change. So if I slow it down, say this is originally where we were. So at this point, as you change the tempo, it's going to change the pitch, just like speeding up an analog tape machine or slowing down an analog tape machine. So if you have to compensate for that, we've had people that have, you know, done this, you know, very incredibly successful for, you know, different tape transfers as soon as you have. Um, so again, select the file, make sure that you're in musical mode from the info line and that you're in tape and adjust your tempo accordingly until you get to the right pitch. Okay. Okay, so I see a comment uh, just about Howling in 6. Watched a couple of videos on YouTube and can't figure out what it's all about. So, you know, Howling in 6 is an incredibly powerful VST instrument. So, you know, not only is it a full blown, you know, full sampler. So if you wanted to sample uh, directly into your projects, you could do that. Uh, but you're going to have you know, all these different instruments that come with it. So most of these instruments are some add-ons here. But if you want to have different forms of synthesis, like wavetable synthesis, granular synths, you will have different uh, sample playback engines, but you could build your own instruments directly. So it's not necessary, you know, you get a, a whole slew of different presets. So if you wanted to have kind of your bread and butter sounds, or if you want it, you know, organ sounds, you can come here and just, you know, start playing and have, you know, really, you know, incredible organ patches. Uh, and then you have all the editing capabilities. So, you know, if you're still learning it, you know, try go through, um, you know, when you get a load here, you know, you could just go through, you know, many of the different instruments. So, you know, you have virtual analog synthesis, granular synthesis, uh, you know, samples that come with it, as well as, you know, there's an organ oscillator. So, you know, different B boxes, there's ethnic instruments. So, you know, go around through some of the, when you go uh, and click on load, uh, click here, and then you could see some of the sounds and start playing around with it. But where Halion also really shines is the ability to, you know, I wanted to just sample notes directly into it and make my own instruments. And you could d actually design your own uh, instruments. And we have, you know, many composers have designed instruments and, you know, are now doing it as a side business where they're actually selling, their, you know, content for them. Okay. All right, so a question. Can you show us uh, audio record modes comping again? Okay. So let's go ahead and I'll just do a new project here. So I'll just kind of put this into a loop. I'll add an audio track here. And I'll just kind of place this into record. I'll just do a loop recording here. So let's just do a couple of different passes. Okay, so now that we've done a couple of passes here, uh, we could just click on show lanes. So now when I click on lanes at this point, um, we could use a little hand tool here and I'm just gonna shut off my snap just to show this. So now if I wanted to audition kind of the different parts, you know, as we do this, what we see kind of highlighted here 
uh, not kind of grayed out is actually what we hear. So I could select different parts that I want it to comp. And now I could just say, I want this part from that. And as we close the lane there, we could just have our different parts that have been comped like so. So that should give you, so once you have kind of multiple passes, come over here, select the comp tool, and you could use kind of different tools to, you know, if you hold down the comp tool with, you know, different modifier keys, uh, you're able to, you know, like if you hold down uh, command or control, you could audition each one and be able to select. And if you need to change the boundaries of the comp, we could do it just like so. All right, I'm gonna adjust my microphone here real quick. I'll just mute this, bear with me. Otherwise it's gonna fall off, make a big clunk. Okay, so the microphone adjusted. Okay, so we have, hi Greg, could you please touch on Pad Shop 2? So Pad Shop 2 is a pretty remarkable instrument. So, and it's a granular synthesizer. So let's go over here and look at our instruments. So we'll just kind of come over here. And what a granular synthesizer does is if we could think of almost like uh, glass as being made of tiny, tiny little bits of sand. Um, so it's kind of takes, you know, it's almost like taking those different uh, bits of sand and doing synthesis on that. So you can drag and drop any audio directly into the sound. And what, what it does exceptionally well is just kind of coming over here and I want to now just let me just set this to all MIDI inputs. And being able to take different forms of samples and you could drag and drop samples directly into it and kind of break apart this sound. Uh, and, you know, so if you wanted to, you know, and where Patch Shop really excels is kind of different sounds that will evolve over time. So you take kind of one sound. And these are some of the, one of the things you could do if you wanted to explore. If you go to Online Music Foundry, Gary Gibbons, kind of during the uh, pandemic, is actually gone through and just did with six other sound designers released a whole uh, batch of free pad shop sounds. So if you want to have just one sound like for like maybe like soundtracks that will just kind of constantly evolve. And there's also uh, Steinberg, I think Dom Segalis had done, um, you know, a whole bank for Synergy. So if you wanted to come over here and just kind of have. We have just kind of one note. just play kind of a couple of pitches here and have it evolve over time. So it's not, uh, it's a bit of, of a different, more subtle synth, but think of it as kind of being able to drag and drop any sound into there. So if I just go to my media bay, let's say I just go to different loops, uh, and if I want it to drop that sound in, So it's a lot of film composers kind of secret weapon, but you know, check out the synergy library that Steinberg did. I think you could search it through like a YouTube and also check out uh, 
the online music foundry what Gary Gibbons did. I think that's a wonderful bank of free presets and take advantage of it. Okay, so let's move on. Thanks for all great questions. Okay, so I see a question from Greg McCarty. Why am I having such a latency problem with my keyboard, a Yamaha digital piano? I load it as an instrument track, uh, reduce samples to 128, but still have the same problem. Um, so make sure, you know, I'm not sure if you're using the sounds um, like just as the, if you're playing it back as a controller or just playing it back as a digital piano. Um, but check, you know, one thing to check if you're having latency issues is a lot of people may start off their Cubase project uh, and when you go to your mix console, they may have different effects in the master faders like a multiband compressor or limiter and sometimes those plugins can cause a lot of latency uh, overall in MIDI. You could also just kind of come here, try to click on a constrained delay compensation and when you click on constrained delay compensation, that will automatically um, kind of bypass some of those plugins. Make sure that um, you know generally the Yamaha USB driver works works very well. So I would check those things to make sure that you don't have any plugins in your project. And if you're just doing just kind of a straight MIDI uh, in and out of your system, but you shouldn't really have uh, such latency. You know, if you're playing virtual instruments um, and let's say, you know, if you have your pad shop and you're playing and it doesn't seem so responsive, uh, one thing that you could do to see if it's actually your keyboard controller is if you hit uh, option or alt K and then you could use your a software MIDI keyboard where you could use your computer keyboard. And it's see if you have the same latency there. If you have the same latency there, then it's not going to be the MIDI driver, but something else it's set. So try setting your constrained delay compensation and see if there's any plugins on input that could be causing latency. Okay, so um, from Millard Brown. Hi, Greg. I got a message from... Uh, audio alignment that one of one targets could not be aligned. What causes this and how can it be fixed? Um, I haven't really come across that message and we'll just show the audio alignment for the benefit of people that haven't seen it. Let me see. I think it may have a project where we could show it here quickly. Okay, so what the audio alignment generally does is let's just turn this down a little bit. Yeah, you know, if we have uh, alignment, like maybe these aren't rhythmically as tight. So just. And what this would allow you to do is to, when you go to the auto audio alignment, you could click here uh, and we could add a reference track and then take the other tracks as targets and choose to align the audio and that will automatically. Align it. So I think maybe if you get a message like that saying one of the targets couldn't be aligned is maybe it is so far out of time that you may have to kind of manually edit it a little bit. So let me just see if I move this all the way over here and I'll just undo uh, that alignment. So let's say if I move this and I say I want this as my target and I want all these let's see if we get a message here indicating that one of the targets might be out okay. 
So you may have to kind of do some editing to, so I got the message there, but you may have to just do some editing on one of the parts if it's really kind of far out to, uh, for it to kind of automatically do alignment. So you may have to manually edit that one just a little bit. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, what is the best, cheapest way to buy WaveLab? I have a Zoom H5 and I'm trying to use the WaveLab LE key and then upgrade. Uh, I cannot register, I'm outside US or Canada. Um, so I'm not sure if maybe you bought the Zoom from a US or Canadian dealer. Um, sometimes, uh, like if you buy outside of the country, some of the dealers, uh, sometimes aren't authorized for that. So you may run into that. Um, but I know you could get the, uh, wave lab elements, I think starts at, you know, 99 bucks. So that's a, a pretty easy, uh, way to get into wave lab there, but you know, you may want to check with your retailer to make sure that they're authorized to sell, uh, to the country where you're at. Um, so sometimes you run into licensing schemes, licensing scenarios like that. So, but you could always uh, just try the Wave Lab elements, and you could uh, get a trial version as well. Okay, question. Hi, Greg. Is there? I see they're running a sale on Nuendo. Is there a reason to go from Cubase to Nuendo? You know, it really depends on your workflow. Uh, you know, some of the things that Nuendo is going to add on top of the functionality of Cubase is going to be support for Dolby Atmos mixing. It's going to have uh, game audio connect. So if you're doing a lot of work with uh, audio kinetic wise, it makes a lot of sense. Also, if you're doing a lot of ADR functionality, uh, like we're doing dialogue replacement, if you're doing a lot of creative sound design, there's some additional plugins like post filter as well as uh, randomizer, there's um, you know audio reconforming. So if you need to reconform to picture edits that have occurred, uh, you know there's more you know beyond Dolby Atmos. It will do 7191 and you know up to 22.2 surround sound. So the two will share the same audio engine. So it's um, you know, so there's no real difference. So, you know, check those very particular things that are in Nuendo. And if they make sense for your workflow, you know, some people will go, I never do dialogue replacement or ADR. Uh, and some people are like, oh, I, you know, do, you know, music for games and working with Wise makes total sense and it's a game changer for me. So it really depends on if those features make sense. And it's a, you know, it's a great time to upgrade if it does, because you can save a lot of money. Okay, so I see question, how do I get more stable MIDI clock and notes without jitter? Um, so I haven't really run into any issues with MIDI clock. Um, so uh, are you, so when you say notes without jitter, so generally MIDI notes don't have jitter uh, when you do that. So, um, so check, you know, see if maybe, I think it's Cree Samad, Samadhi um, or cry Samadhi. Maybe if you could tell me what you're, uh, what you're sending MIDI clock out to, um, and what MIDI interface you're using. Some MIDI interfaces deal with sync better than others if it's, um, but generally, you know, notes, MIDI notes don't have jitter in them. So if you could specify, you know, maybe specify more what you're doing. Uh, but, you know, MIDI clock is just sending out MIDI timing to particular devices. Some devices don't sync well to MIDI clock. Uh, some sync better. Some, you know, MIDI interfaces sync better uh, or handle MIDI clock and synchronization better than others as well. Okay. And I see uh, you kind of specified MIDI to hardware synths. So, um yeah, so you know, I, I just did a bunch of MIDI clock synchronization, and I have some old Steinberg Mid X eights that I'm still using, and I didn't have any problems. So, but check, you know, to see what hardware synths you're actually using, as well. Okay. So I see a question, uh, you know, and also before we move on with MIDI clock, you know. 
sometimes if you're going, if you're daisy chaining into devices, you know, I've seen some people, it's like, you know, you go, you go, uh, you know, one MIDI port out to three different pieces of hardware. And then the fourth piece of hardware MIDI clock is being sent to see if you have a, if making a direct connection to the synth from the MIDI interface makes a difference as well. Sometimes I've seen it get messed up. Uh, when you are, you know, cascading through multiple devices as well. Okay, question. Uh, any recommendations on where to start learning Cubase for guitarists using Wade FX as DI wet track? Also slip editing both DI and wet track simultaneously. So, so you know, if you wanted to do... Let's take a look at, uh, maybe I'll just take some of these vocal parts. So let's say if I do this, and I'll just move this over. We'll make this a little larger, a little easier to see. Okay, so if I wanted to do, you know, if these were like, I'm not familiar with the... Um, weight effects but let's say if i have you know two different parts you know you could probably just group them together and then as you move one they will both kind of move together let me just move these over here and let's try you know if you're doing slip editing so let's say if i have cut these parts and I could cut both of them together. And then if I hold down, you know, uh, control alt and control or command option, you could choose to kind of slip, you know, both events simultaneously together. So if you're doing different edits, you know, just try selecting the, di you know, so if I take these two events here, and I ungroup them, so Control or Command U. Now they will both kind of move independently of each other. But if these, if I just choose to group these two together, uh, and that's just Command G, that as I do an edit, that they'll be kind of grouped together. So try just Control or Command G. Uh, to group, and then you could do just do your edits that way, and I think that will help you out. Okay, and this is probably just a continuation. Uh, see, after you you have recorded your guitar parts, how do you best tidy up the audio files, fades, noise, etc.? What is your routine? You know, and we we discussed this a little bit. Let's just jump back to um, just jump back to where we were here. Um, You know, sometimes you want to keep some of the grit in guitar amps, but, you know, like if you have just a lot of noise in particular files, you know, there's no reason, like, you know, you could do noise gates like we discussed, but, you know, when you kind of come over here, you know, you could take your snap off and like while we have hiss and you can hear kind of a little bit. I'll just turn this up so you can hear kind of the hum of the amp here a little bit. So again, you can... Like when this channel comes in is, you know, and while it's playing, you may not notice it, but if you wanted to kind of clean it up, just kind of, you know, do this type of thing. And then you could just kind of easily clean up, you know, so you don't really hear the guitar until it's going. And you may hear, like, you know, like if you wanted to get rid of buzz, you know, looking at the EQ for the particular channel here. So let's go to the channel view. And, you know, you could just kind of hear 
that particular buzz. And a lot of times you may notice that it's going to be at, you know, like in America, it could be at 60 hertz, you know. Um, so kind of notching out 60 hertz with kind of a very narrow cue. Sometimes that can help as well. Uh, and if Europe, you may have it at, you know, 50 hertz because of the electricity. So... So often, you know, notching out buzz that can uh, make a difference as well. But just kind of, you know, cleaning up stuff like if you don't have to have, you know, like, a, a, you know, times here. I know people will go through and edit everything out. Sometimes people will go through and leave it in to make it sound more authentic. So there, there's a couple of different approaches to that. But, you know, just some basic house cleaning with that. All right. So we had a question sent in about live uh use so let's go ahead and i think have a project set up for this okay so let's just read the question here um okay just find it here uh, live performance is a topic how should one set up Cubase to play 15 to 20 songs with approximately 10 tracks audio and MIDI each I would like to avoid Ableton live please help I saw your hangout about the arranger track that's nice but if I don't want to mix down my audio tracks to one stereo backing track, I'd have 200 tracks in my live project. It would be hard to see where I am. Isn't there something to control the projects, uh, when to activate and play a project? So the easiest way I think for, and this is why I've seen lots of people do successfully in you know different Las Vegas shows, um, is you know we'll just kind of get this set up. Let me make all these tracks a little s smaller. Okay, so let's say I have a number of songs laid out in my arrangement here. So as we, so I'll just go ahead and mute that. So let's say this is gonna be So let's say, you know, and we don't have to mix down our tracks and using the folder track. So I know a lot of people will just have everything laid out as one uh, particular project. So I'll come here. Let me just select and I'll just change the colors of these particular tracks. Make it a little easier. Okay, so what they what people often do is have each song as a different folder. So there's no need to mix down your tracks. Um, so this would be, you know, tracks, you know. So you think of this as your first song, second song, third, fourth song. Then come over here and make an arranger track for each song in, in your project. Um, and what we have sometimes is when people change the set, maybe like every other night they may change the set between a set of different songs. So now that we have these arranger tracks and you could come here and just add, uh, just grab your pencil tool and grab your arranger track. And at that point you're, you know, you've defined your parts and we could define these as songs. So we'll say... So at this point, you know, if you if you decide to change the set, you could just come here and lay out the set just like this. And then 
you know, it, you could have different key commands to automatically play to the end of this, you know, advance to the next arranger track and be able to do that. And then if you needed to switch the order of the songs for the next night, you just change the arranger change, the arranger chain. So at this point, you could just, you know, have all of your songs in the set laid out for you. Um, and just simply change these as fit. And this would include all of your tempo changes, all, of, you know, and this way you could easily just, you know, take everything that's laid out and just, you know, moving one thing here, you could change the order. So, you know, just because you're using the arranger track doesn't mean that everything has to be mixed down. You could see all of your different parts for your arrangements laid out for you here. And that's how a lot of people work. I got a call from them, so yeah. Sorry, my wife had to check something. All right, so let's move on. Sorry about the interruption. Okay, so we have a question, what's panning? Okay, so panning is placing different uh, tracks in like the left and right channel. So if I wanted to come here, uh, we could see, like if I have a stereo track, I could now grab the pan control and just be able to move it to different channels. And this is helpful like if you're doing uh, different guitar parts or if you're mixing. So let's say we jump back to uh, this project. You know, a very typical thing is to take your guitars. So let's say we have our guitars here. What we could do with the panning, if you have two guitars, instead of having these both panned to the center, we can make it often sound bigger just by Panning one guitar to the left and one all the way to the right. So when you solo, that guitar is only in the left speaker and this guitar is only in the right speaker. And if both of them together can make for a big, huge sound. And we go to. That point. So that's what panning is used for. So it's a very kind of. You know, a lot of people sometimes will abuse panning or sometimes people won't do panning. It can make, you know, like if you're trying to get a keyboard and, you know, horns, like a horn section and a guitar and an organ to all fit, you may want to pan those to different areas within your left to right spectrum so that they could all kind of fit on in your project. Okay. Let's move on. Thanks for all great questions. All right, my timeline just jumped way ahead, so let me. Okay, so, and we see question again, is there a Cubase on iPhone? So yeah, you could get Cubasis for iPhone, and so. So check that out. And now if you're an Android user, you can get Cubasis for Android as well. Uh, so question or comment, I've uh, been struggling learning Cubase efficiently for several years. Is there a basic through immediate structured training that's recommended? You know, I think a lot of times you have to figure out, you know, what I would recommend is, you know, not to necessarily learn every single thing, but figure out one thing that you want to accomplish. And, uh, you know, it's like, I want to figure out how to get this to work and do that. And, you know, the next day I'm, I'm here in the process and figure that out. But there's, you know, there's different, uh, you know, Cubase tutorial websites, you know, there's, 
a slew of tutorials on the youtube.com slash Cubase, like the channel you're watching this on has, you know, several hundred videos and we do these hangouts a lot. So instead of learning every single part of Cubase that you may not use in your productions, try to figure out exactly what you want to accomplish and then be able to, you know, learn that one particular thing through the process and develop your own workflow. And I think that will help you. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so question, this is probably a newbie question, but is there a utility to verify that all parts of Cubase are up to date currently using Cubase elements? So, you know, we don't automatically update, uh, but what you could do is, you know, you, if you look at the Cubase hub um, here, you can, you know, once you look here, if you go to like, when you start a new project, this will kind of give you all the latest information for new updates you can see in the new section here. So the latest version that you have with Cubase Elements is gonna be 10.5.2, and that was just released, uh, I think last week. So, but it won't automatically update it for you. Um, that could be probably a little more annoying. So, but you'll often, if you subscribe to, you know, like the, to Cubase on Facebook, or if you do, you know, different groups like that, uh, or just check your Steinberg hub, you, you should you know, be notified of different things, so. Okay, so question, is there some best practice to create MIDI drum grooves out of existing mastered single track song material hit point method works for snare very well, but kick is more solid due to bass masking? Um, it, you know, what I would do if you're going to do something like that is, you know, maybe just accentuate the EQ as you're doing, as you're doing it. So, you know, it's not really designed necessarily to do, um, you know, like individual parts, you know, but a lot of times what people will do is just kind of accentuate like where the kick would be. So if we take... So let's say if I have just this track. You could try just accentuating. You know, and once you have that, try EQing and you could apply that EQ to um, the particular file and then do a, uh, do a hit point based on that. So, you know, you could, you know, very easily just kind of isolate the kick frequencies for that, or, you know, just kind of play along. And after a while, you'll probably get the groove pretty well. Okay, so uh, hello from Denmark. I'm using Cubase 10.5, but I cannot use my Nectar 3 plugin because Cubase crash, uh, kind regards. Make sure that when you look at your Nectar 3, you know, it's probably running a VST2 and a VST3 version. So if we come over here to your VST plugin manager, make sure that when you go to your VST effects, that you see that it's going to be actually working as a VST. If you see a VST3 and a VST2, make sure that you're you're not using the VST2 and that you had the VST3. So you may want to make sure that the VST2 isn't uh, being seen by Cubase. And I think if you do that, then you should be okay. And it's kind of a known problem. I think that's an isotope plugin. So a lot of their VST2 plugins uh, cause issues. So it would probably be best just to make sure you're running the VST3 version. Okay. Um, 
So let's see. Uh, so we have people checking in from India. That's great. Uh, let's see. Uh, hi, Greg. Thanks for all your help when triggering drum patterns on the instrument track with Groove Agent. The pattern only plays once. The second trigger does not play. Any thoughts? So let's go ahead and check this out. Okay, so I'm going to adjust my octave range down here. So as soon as I play, let me just check my... So here it's gonna play that pattern until I let go of the MIDI note. Then it's gonna play another pattern. So how it's working for me, and I'll just reread the question to make sure. So it says, when triggering drum patterns on the instrument track with Groove Agent, the pattern only plays once, and the second trigger does not play. So as soon as I let go of the key here, it will stop playing. It'll play the pattern until I let go of the key or press another key. So let's see if it will... So I'm gonna press another key. So as, as long as I hold the key down here. It's gonna play that pattern until I let go. So that pattern is gonna be just continually triggered. And we'll restart as soon as I re-trigger that MIDI note again. So hitting it a second time, we'll just repeat the pattern again. So that's how my groove agent is working. So if yours is working differently, just kind of let me know. But as soon as I hold, you know, the pattern will play as long as the key is held down. Okay. Okay, so it's the question um, regarding spectral layers. Can we use only one instance of spectral layers and edit multiple files inside of Cubase? So if I have a number of different files, and again, there's a spectral layers hangout tomorrow. So if you guys want to check that out, I think Mike is going to be doing it. So it's... So if we're doing kind of offline processes, I could come here, let's go to audio to extensions and I could go to spectral layers. So as soon as we do that, now I could do edits there. And if I go to another instance, I could just do my editing here, kind of a separate instance of spectral layers and let's select this file and do extension so I have independent functions here for editing so now if I select that file we see those edits apply different edits apply to each individual file so you could do that just by going to audio and to extension so you could run multiple uh, spectral layers editing instances on different files with independent settings Okay. Okay, so just seeing uh, a question um, about the e-licensor availability in India. So yeah, I'm not totally familiar with the uh, with the distribution in India uh, for e-licensors. So. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure, but you know, it, it is generally something that dealers can carry as well. All right, so people checking in from a rainy Sweden, people saying, say hi to Ryan for us. All right. 
Okay, so a question, uh, how to pair a digital mix console with Cubase Mixer. So you know, it depends on your mix console. A lot of them may work as like a Mackie control, or if you have you know Yamaha mixers, they're very easy to work with. But if you go to your studio menu, to studio setup, you could click on your plus sign here. So let's say if you have a Yamaha O1V96, you know, then you could have this connected by USB you tell what input port is, and output port that MIDI communication is going on. And then that will be your control surface. You could also, if you if your mix console works with uh, Mackie control, you could add a Mackie control and kind of do define the inputs and outputs of exactly where you want it to be and you could have Mackie control for that so not every uh, mixer has control surface capability um, so like if, you know if you have like even a Yamaha TF it doesn't have a remote control surface layer I don't think so it really depends on the capabilities of the mix console as well. But if it, if the mix console is designed for that, I think like even the Behringer X32 will work as Mackie controls as well. Okay, so good to see Stanley Durbin from Poolsville, Maryland on Hangout. Not too far from me. Uh, it says, in the old version of Cubase, I was able to bounce separate audio parts down to a single file. Um, in the newest version, I don't seem to be able to do that. Is there a setting I'm missing? So let's say if I had a number of files here. So let's say I have that. You know, uh, I think it'll kind of work the same way as previous versions. So let's say if I just come here. So if I wanted to do an export audio mix down, um, we could just say, well, let's uh, create an audio track and insert into pool. So we'll call this mix down, whatever. And I'll just say export audio. Now this will, I'll choose my stereo out here. So this will take all those tracks All right, so I can set my left and right locators. I'll just say export audio. And then this will be a mix down file of all three of those files. So I play back, should be some. So that's all of them mixed down together. You could also select multiple events here. And if you go to edit to render in place, there's a uh, render settings. And if we just say, um, you know, you want to mix down to one audio file at this point, you could just take all those and mix it down to one audio file as well. So th those are two different ways of being able to mix down multiple files, uh, to one separate part, like a sub mix. Okay, so um, all right, so a question: uh, How to merge multiple MIDI tracks into one part? All right, so I will just go ahead and. Let's say if I had it just a quick and I had different MIDI takes here. So let's say um, I'll put these into my MIDI record into new parts. So as I just record some MIDI data here, just hit some high notes. All right, and I'll just put into a quick loop. So let's say I wanna record again, I'll hit some higher notes and we can see this is gonna be kind of stacked. 
on top of each other. And let's say I'll do one more pass. And if I wanted to merge these all together now, say some low notes. So these are basically going to be three stacked MIDI parts on top of each other. And what you could do, so if I move one, you know, I could still see kind of there's two layers and let's move this layer. So we can have those three parts that are kind of stacked on top of each other. But if you grab the glue tool and just hold down alt or option, I think that will automatically merge them into one part. So if you have them stacked, you can just kind of stack them on top of each other and hold down the alter option key with the glue and that will merge. Okay, so uh, question, hi Greg, can you please explain how to work with channel monitoring in Cubase 10.5? It seems to me that monitoring the selected track is not working the same way as before. So if you are running into like a different channel monitoring uh, issues, um, the preferences that, you, you know, it could be that the preferences had changed. So, you know, you could have it, um, the preference I think most people kind of gravitate to is when you go to VST uh, and then you have it set to auto monitoring type. Uh, I think by default is set to manual. So whenever you arm a track, you then have to manually set the monitoring mode. Um, and then there's different preferences so that, you know, it's while it's record enabled that it will monitor. So if that's record enabled or while it's set to, sorry, uh, while record is running or tape machine style. So I think tape machine style is like, you know, as it's, re if you have data here before, um, so let's say if I just did a quick recording that it's going to monitor while we're recording and then when we punch out, the monitor won't be there. So if I'm wanting to do an overdub with tape machine style and I play, we're going to hear the existing track. And then when I hit record, that's when the monitoring for the newly recorded track gets turned on. So try going to your preferences and go to VST and set it to tape machine style. Okay, we see Michael from Weatherford, Texas checking in. It's good to see you, Michael. Okay, hi, Greg. Would Steinberg plan a new version, an improvement in Cubase 11 of the score editors, uh, a light version of Dorco inside of Cubase, for instance? I think we'll always see some improvements. I think every version of Cubase has had some nice improvements in the score editor. Uh, you may see some technology from Dorco in, but I'm I think it would still kind of have a, you know, it's not going to be Dorco inside of Cubase um, because they're, you know, there's, you know, a long history of workflows and differences that we don't want to necessarily, uh, you know, get rid of. Um, but I think you may see some more Dorco features. And as the future goes on, now that, you know, Dorco is at the 3.5 version and the team has been pretty miraculous with kind of getting the core functionality in such a short time that, you know, I think, you know, we'll see more integration stuff coming between the two where it makes sense. Okay. Good to see Jazz Dude on a Hangout. Um, okay. So, uh, let's see, question, Cubase Pro 10.5 user here. Uh, there's any way to group a bunch of automation points to ease the selection process uh, with just one click or automation follows events is the only way. So if we have, um, let's say a number of automation points here, it really could depend, you know, so let's say if we have volume automation here, Okay, so, you know, if we move events, you know, we could have the automation automatically move with that. But you could also just, you know, if, if you go from the bottom, you could select events and be able to move multiple automation points like so. Or if you wanted to increase 
or decrease these automation points. We could, you know, you could kind of change the, you know, scale. Or if you say, okay, I want this all louder or softer proportionally, you could go to the upper center. So try, and sometimes it's a little confusing because we could have point automation that's selected by range. So, you know, if you wanted to, let's say, duplicate that particular range, you could do it like so. Um, or we could just come over here and if you select from the bottom, this is when you have the combined object selection range tool, then you could just, you know, move your automation or, you know, move it up or down now that the automation points themselves are actually selected. So. Okay, uh, so it says, hey Greg, hope you're fine. Can you tell me if there's a way to color all selected tracks at once? So let's say I have all these tracks here. I'm gonna select all these tracks. Uh, I'm just gonna go to my color palette and then I'll just say, let's make them all green, blue. So once they're selected, you can just go to your color, color palette here and choose the colors that you want and all the parts will change. Okay, uh, so James says, hey Greg, uh, just saying hello. Glad to see Steinberg release Cubasis for Android. Though I'm an iPad user, it will be appreciated by a community of users that has been neglected. Yeah, there's been a lot of you know hard work put into it to make sure that technically is gonna make sense and work. So, you know, uh, but yeah, I think it's gonna, it's gonna be a, a great solution for a lot of people. Um, so, Hey Greg, how do I make my vocals in perfect time with the tempo of the song? You know, there's a number of ways to do that. You know, it depends, you know, a lot of people will do just find a track that has some vocals in it here. You know, if the tempo is, you know, if the vocal has been recorded at a completely different tempo, you know, there's methods of doing that. And I did a, kind of a whole video and I should have copied over the project file. Um, but, you know, if you find that the vocalist is just like a little bit early or late or maybe their timing isn't so spot on, you know, being able to, you know, come here. You know, especially being able to do, okay, I wanted to take this particular phrase and let's just say I'll do shift X and to split and then being able to just kind of slip the events, you know, being able to change kind of the timing of different things on a vocal can make a big difference. So, you know, if you find that the vocal is recorded at, you know, 30 beats a minute slower than the original, you know, if you do a tempo detection of both of the files and go to your audio menu and place them into different time positions. And if you want to email me, I could send you a link to a video. Uh, and then you want to just choose set definition by tempo for both of them and then drag the vocal in, then it will match the timing of the original file once it's in musical mode. Uh, but, you know, play around just by, you know, coming over here, cutting and then just kind of splitting and nudging notes. So if you have the vocalist, it's, you know, consistently later behind. That's a great way of being able to edit to make sure that the vocals uh, will kind of match the timing of the song. Uh, and if you want uh, to email me at Greg at uh, or I'm sorry, at um, Club Cubase at Steinberg.de, I can send you a link to the file as well. All right, so we have a question from Frank, Frank Vollmer. I have a good friend named Frank Vollmer as well. He spells it with an E at the end. Uh, so it says, hi, Greg. Hi, guys. Is there a template for NI Machine Micro? So I'm not sure if you need a template necessarily for that. Um, so, um, and so, you know, um, you know, just, I believe it just kind of works as a, a controller. So, you know, I don't think you'll need a specific template for that. 
Okay, so I see Ace who's apologizing for posting his question twice. Um, yeah, so I caught it this time. So, but um, I'll, I'll try to look for it in the future. And I think he has a question about his Korg M1 getting that synced up. Sometimes if uh, you post your question before the hangout starts, when the hangout starts, the question disappears. So I'll try to look for some questions posted early. Okay. Um, all right. So Greg, uh, also another question. Can you somehow have a bunch of rack instruments following just one single MIDI track? Um, so if you, you know, if you wanted to layer the sound of, you know, rack instruments from, you know, if we have it set up as like a MIDI track here. So I have this MIDI track going out to the Grand 3. And if I wanted this to... Um, so if you wanted to send this out to multiple destinations to like, you know, rack mount instruments, what you could do is go to uh, from a MIDI track. And this doesn't work from an instrument track, but you'll see MIDI sends. And what you're able to do here is to pick your destination. So you can say, okay, I want to send this out to my Nectar Panorama, which is connected to this piece of outboard gear. I want to send this out to my UR20C, my UR24C on MIDI channel 16. I want to send this out to you know, different destinations here. Um, so that way that piano could be sent to four more dis destinations via a, uh, by MIDI sends on a MIDI track. So I'm not sure if that's what you wanted to do or if you wanted timing to follow, um, you know, but if you wanted to just layer sounds out to rack instruments, that's probably the easiest way to do it. You could also just, come here and you know duplicate the track and choose to you know duplicate the tracks and then just you know change the output for each of these if you wanted to so you could say send this out to here send this one out to my UR24C and you could choose different destinations uh, as you work there so I think if that's uh, what you want to accomplish just let me know uh but if i misunderstood just you know just maybe if you could leave a quick message we might be able to get to it before the end okay so we have a question from millard uh hi greg please touch on the system component information window can anything maybe like era service be deactivated to give benefit in cpu or memory available or not thanks um so I don't think that deactivating, so I think if we come over here to, um, to the VST plugin, uh, let's see if it's, it's not there. It's gonna be the system component information. So here you could see, um, you know, different, uh, you know, program plugins and you know I, I think that deactivating these and so if you you know want it to I don't think unless it's actually being used that it's going to be taking a lot of CPU resources so I don't think you'll see any change unless you're actually using that functionality it's like when you're doing era function ARA functionality you're doing you know, Yukon or head tracking, that that is when it's actually going to be taking CPU. Um, I could play around with it some, but I think it's going to be pretty negligible uh, for freeing up uh, system resources for you. Okay, it's a question, crossfade. Uh, do I have to think about crossfade when using comping and then bounce? Uh, Case two, if it has to be the scissor tool, not comping, can you show how to use crossfade functions in Cubase? All right, so let's just take a quick look. Oops. 
Okay, so there's uh, some some little crossfade stuff that you know. So let's say if I'm here, and I was comping, let's say bass track here. So I'll just go ahead and shut off my and grab my comping tool here. So I say I'll just comp. And let me just see if I may have this on follow chords. Let's just turn that off. Okay. So let me just uh, re revert this really quickly. Okay, so let's go look at our lanes. So I'll now just kind of come over here and start comping. So let's say if I want, you know, different parts laid out. I'll just turn my snap off here. So let's say I want. So if once you have your comp, if you wanted to just select all of the events, you could hit X and that will do a slight crossfade between every single one if needed. Now there's also a function in Cubase here where you could have auto fades settings. So you could just have auto fade and auto crossfade. So anytime that an audio part actually starts or ends or they're kind of butted up, it'll do just kind of a slight uh, fade for you on playback uh, and, and to enable that again just kind of come right over here and you could just enable the auto fade settings um, but if you need it to do cross fades a lot of times it does a really good job of you know and it could also depend upon as you're editing if you have you know zero crossing enabled you know if you have it snapped to zero crossing for the edits that can make a big difference um so, but if you just use like the scissor tool for comping, you know, just as soon as you have your parts all done, select it here and then hit the letter X and that will be doing um, crossfade there. Okay. So you see a question or a comment, uh, I'm facing issue with audio performance. You know, if you're running out of audio performance you know the one thing you could do let me just see if it's okay it says when i load a few vst instruments of how and it breaks for a while and starting you know try coming over here to your studio setup and you know depending on your instrument you could try to come here and try go to your control panel and try raising the buffer up and see if that makes a difference if you're doing a lot of stuff in Halion. Um, something else you could do depending on how much RAM you have. So let's come over here to my VSTi and let's add a Halion. You'll see settings here for how much um, is being streamed from disk. So if we come to options and I guess that just made my Cubase misbehave. So let me just... All right, I'm just going to uh, reboot my computer real quick. If you guys want to hang out, um, I'm going to reboot. I'll be just a minute, and let me just reboot and make everything a little faster here. Bear with me. So just hang on for a couple minutes, and I'll be back. All right, so I think I'm back. We'll just let me refresh just to make sure. 
Sorry about that. Okay, so all right, so I'm just gonna check the audio feed, make sure. Okay, so so also with Halion, you know, when you go here, try to, you know, you'll go to the options menu and make sure that you have more uh, preload time and you could adjust that, so. So come right over here and within Halion, go to options and try increasing your disc preload and that should help. And if you have a number of different tracks also, depending on how big the instruments are and how your multi-core is set up, you know, splitting like, uh, you know, fewer instruments within m more instances of Halion can spread across your CPU core usage a little better. Okay. All right, my timeline jumped, so let me jump back. Okay, so I, th I may have lost a couple questions. Let's see. Um, okay, let me see if I could jump back here with my timeline to get back to where I was on our screen. Sorry for hassle here. Let me just. All right, so we had a question on um, that I remember is. I think it was from Millard about does, you know, doing a bounce selection, uh, if that uh, makes a difference. Okay, sorry. Um, so will that in incorporate the different effects? So if we do just a bounce selection, um, we may just have it to the point where that would just render it without any effects. So if you wanted to render with different effects and gain and stuff like that, that's when we would use the render in place. But just doing a bounce selection, you think of it more for uh, doing for edits and stuff like that. So I may have lost a couple of questions and my timeline jumped. So I apologize for that. But let's go ahead and... Um, move on okay so it says i would like to set up a high pass or eq cut on a hotkey toggle what's the best way to set that up so i think if we come over here let's take a look at key commands let's see if that's actual Just open it up and see if we can find the exact name that's used for it for the audio track. So it may not be keyboard shortcut.
Yeah, so there, there isn't, I don't see a keyboard shortcut to turn that on and off, but I know what a lot of people do is use the quick controls. And if you activate uh, the first quick control preset that you could just you have your MIDI controller set up to do that. So once you have your MIDI controller set up, let's say under your track quick controls here. So you say your track quick controls and you have your MIDI controller. Um, so as soon as we have those defined at that point, you could have your MIDI controller, you know, control volume or your high cut on and off uh, to do these different functions here just from using faders. But I don't know of a way of doing it with a keyboard shortcut to turn it on and off. So, but try the track quick controls. And if you have like, you know, any little MIDI fader box, you should be all set. Okay. Um, so question, hello, I have Cubase 10.06 in Mac High Sierra. I don't have export video, replace audio and video, et cetera, as a drop down feature. Reinstalled, done that, tried contacting Steinberg, impossible. Well, uh, that function wasn't in 10.06. Um, so I think it was in eight or previous to 902 and then they incorporated I think with version 903 a brand new video engine so if you want to export to video that's available only in 10.5 with the new video engine so that's why you're not seeing it in 10.06 okay so uh, question is there a way to have fades applied automatically at the start and end of each clip when I make cuts um, so if you have the auto fades set up here, so you know as you go to make cuts, uh, just have this enabled, uh, and then you know you could have your auto fades uh, just turned on. So anytime you make a cut, and you could do that on a track by track basis. Okay. Let me just go through a couple more questions here. Um, all right, is it positive, maybe possible to be in monitor mode and still hear the output of the selected track at the same time as the input until I press the record button? So that way you will just, again, go to preferences and under VST, you could, you know, one of these uh, while record, Running or tape machine style will allow you to hear the existing track until you're recording. Then it will monitor what is actually being recorded. So preferences, VST, and you probably want it to be while well, record running or tape machine style. Okay, and, and I see next point, I'm aware of the tape machine style mode, but it's not what I'm looking for. Um, so I think that will get you the same, um, you know, if you, if you tell me why the tape machine style doesn't work for you, that'd be helpful. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, are the controls on the CC121 user programmable, configurable? I don't need it to control the channels. What I would like to, what would be really great though is to turn it into a control surface for the mix control. So you can have the, you know, there's four user assignable buttons on the CC121 plus a, um, plus a user definable foot switch. Uh, you have the 12 rotary encoders and those 12 rotary encoders could also be used for your track quick controls or VST quick controls. And you could define those for any aspect that you want. So if I was here, I could go to my track quick controls. And if you hit, I think, uh, like EQ type and all bypass on the CC121 that you, the top eight encoders will just simply work as your uh, your quick control. So you could control these particular parameters there. Um, but that's, you know, and, you know, hence the name one to, you know, the CC one to one is kind of like a one to one control of kind of the Cubase channel. But you can use 
uh, the eight encoders for quick controls and the four user assignable functions in foot switch to define other things. Okay. Okay, so it says, how can I automate a Wawa guitar virtual effect in Cubase 10? So let's say if I will I'll revert this. Okay, so let's say if I want to put a Wawa on my base part here. Let me just make sure it's connected so we can hear it. Okay, so let's say I'll do awful thing and put Wawa on the base. So I'll come over here to my inserts. I will uh, go to my VST amp effects or just to the Wawa pedal as well. So we'll come here. Okay, so let's say if I'm doing this and all right, so we could choose to have this respond to modulation. So I'm going to create a MIDI track. And this MIDI track, the output will now go to the Wawa. So as I record this MIDI data here. Let me just, so I'll s just set this up. So we'll go to our Wawa and so what you want to do is just to have uh, this show up as, you know, you could automate it or just use your modulation control. So if you want it to just record, so let's say. So while I'll just place this track into record. So and as soon as you have, let's just say from all MIDI inputs and then that will automate. So you may have to make a MIDI track and set its output destination. Let me set that to channel one. to the wah wah pedal and that should automate it for you. Okay. Okay, so question, what is constrained delay compensation? I noticed the volume always goes down after I activate this. So if we have, let's say if I was playing a, a virtual instrument here Okay, so now when I'm playing this, we have pretty typical latency, so latency feels fine. But if I go to my mix console here, and let's say if I add a bunch of different plugins, and let's just add some like multiband compressor, so that adds to the latency. And let's just add a couple of those just because we know those are pretty latent. So let's say a multiband envelope shaper. So now my latency is increasing as I do this. So I go, let's say back to multiband compressor. So now it's kind of like a badly dubbed Chinese Kung Fu movie. When I play, I hit the note and then it's going to be delayed. And when I look at the uh, latency for the particular channel, we could see that uh, I go to the full mixer view. And we go to look at our channel latency.
that we're gonna have our latency here. So now if I wanted to play that instrument, I would, with better timing, you know, we look at, let's say our particular channel here with, let's say our inserts on it. So I'll just kind of scroll over here. Okay. That if I wanted to minimize the latency, I would turn that on. And what that does is it bypasses those particular effects. So when we come here, so I turn this off, we get the latency, but the effects are enabled. So where we want kind of lower latency for tracking, I will just, So as soon as I turn on delay compensation, that will bypass those plugins are causing a lot of latency. So if you notice a volume increase, it's probably plugins that maybe are on the master bus that are, you know, pumping up the volume, like a limiter or something like that. So that's kind of how you could ditch the intention of the channel latency or the constrained delay compensation function is. Uh, question, is it possible to use a USB mic as talkback in the control room? So it, it, ideally it's not, not the best you, you could. If you're on a Mac platform, you would probably have to set it up as an aggregate device um, and, and have that set up. Uh, if you're on a Windows platform, you'd probably have to use something like um, ASIO for all, um, that will compound the latency and, you know, generally not be the most stable method of, you know, for audio clocking. But if you're on Mac, John, you could just simply connect it into a, uh, create an aggregate device and choose the port. Uh, and you can do that in the audio MIDI setup. Uh, and create an aggregate device. Ideally, you'd want it to kind of be within the same signal. So if you have the option to, when you go to your audio connections, to use one of the available inputs on your control room for the talkback mic, that's the best solution. But you could create on a Mac an aggregate device or use ASIO for all on PC, but it's probably not the best solution. But it'll, it may get you to work uh, if you really need it to. So. Okay, just going through. Okay, so we have a question. I just built a new PC and want to download my Cubase elements I had on my MacBook to the new PC. Can I install easily on a PC? So the installation is not going to be a problem if you had uh, the license. Uh, the Cubase elements could work with a soft e-licensor or a USB e-licensor. So if, you've, if you have it on a USB e-licensor, you could just simply plug it in. Uh, or you could transfer from your Mac to a soft e-license to a... Um, you know, to the USB e-licensor and connect that to the PC. Um, so you could do that as well. Um, and if you don't have a USB e-licensor, you could, uh, I think you could go in and reactivate your license through your My Steinberg account. And basically that would transfer the license over to your new PC. And then it would, I think, void it on your Mac. Okay. Okay, uh, question, hi Greg, how can I trigger and replace the kick or snare sample? So let's take a look how to do that. Okay, so let's say I have an instance of Groove Agent here with just some drum samples loaded. Okay, and I have real drum tracks up top here. So let's say I want to basically send these particular tracks uh, and do like a drum replacement. So let's... Okay. 
So what I could do is I'm going to just double click and we'll go into our sample editor, go to hit points. I'll choose edit hit points. And then what I want to do is just say create MIDI notes and I want to do it on the first selected track where I have Groove Agent selected here and I'm going to put it to C1 and then hit OK. And now we have the notes being triggered in any MIDI device. So if I want to do the same for the snare, I could come here and go to hit points again. And we'll create MIDI notes, place it, and we we'll, could retain the dynamic velocity. And I'll put onto D1 on the first selected track. So now these two parts are just playing. So if I wanted to mute the original kick and snare, these will now be playing back directly in Groove Agent. So if I want to tune my snare. And have, so now we're just hearing the kick and snare from Groove Agent. And if I want to hear it augmented with the original kick and snare. If we want to bypass Groove Agent. So where we were, and now being augmented by the samples. So just go to your hit points, and once you're in the hit points, uh, just you know figure out the threshold and click on Create MIDI Notes. Okay. Okay, so just seeing um, that uh, from Taylor, comment that T guitar is CPU intensive and crashes often when other tracks are in use. Is there anything I could do to minimize the CPU usage when using that plugin? So just kind of like we showed just a little while ago, because when you're, you're obviously when you load up T guitar, it's a tremendous amount of samples. Uh, but try going to let's say if we just have it in Halion Sonic SE or Halion. You could do it kind of either way. But since it is like, you know, a lot of samples and a lot of memory, try going to your options and adjust your preload up, especially, you know, if you, this is kind of set on the conservative side, but adjust the preload up and that will give more memory to uh you know to the the plugin so it's not being kind of choked by memory okay okay so just going through your different comments uh question groove agent 5 and inspector input routing doesn't have a midi out like groove agent se uh, or is it me is it built that way so let's go ahead and take a look so as soon as we have, um, let's load up a full instance of Groove Agent. All right, so we have Groove Agent 01. So when we go to our MIDI inputs, um, so we can see the Groove Agent uh, MIDI out here, but on our inputs, each agent could have its own MIDI input here. So we have four different agents. So it, you know, so you could see uh, the MIDI input, but you may see multiple. Uh, it may not be labeled as MIDI out, um, but as soon as we come over here, so each agent could have its own MIDI output, but it may not be, it may be it's labeled slightly differently, so.
Okay. So just seeing just probably a follow up to our previous question. Sorry, I meant when I, about the triggering the drum patterns is sorry, I meant that when I wrote the pattern at the instrument track, the second trigger does not play. Maybe if you could send a, a file to me, like at a download link at uh, club cubase at uh, steinberg.de, that'd be helpful. Okay. Okay, so we have uh, Avery checking in from Israel. Good to have you on Hangout. Um, so we see, how could I write a G, B, a G over B chord in the chord track? So let's take a look at a chord track. Let's say G with a B in the bass. So, so just come here, you write G, and then you'll have kind of the inversion here for the bass note. So just write G over B. Okay. Okay, so uh, Question, how could I change default project folder? My C drive is full and moved all files to D, but when I open up a new project, it automatically opens a new folder in C drive. So when you go to your Steinberg hub and go to new project, instead of using default location, just prompt for project file location. Then you could just come over here and choose to put it on your D drive. So again, go to your uh, file menu to new project and right here it's kind of a subtle thing but instead of using default location choose to prompt for project location and as a rule of thumb I, I've always found it great to be able to do one project um, you know one folder per project and I think that makes a sense okay um, Okay, so let's see. Okay, so you see, hi Greg, is uh, WaveLab essential for mastering? Will Cubase meet what I need? Can you please roughly master to show a song? So let's go ahead and take a look at this. And I think it's one of the questions that was also mailed in earlier. So. So, you know, it depends on what your definition of mastering is, and there's lots of different uh, expectations and perceptions. So a lot of people consider mastering more of, you know, working, you know, just putting plugins on a two-track file. And if it, and you could do that, you know, very easily with, with WaveLab. So we had a question is also, you know, can we just take a two track file and run it through plugins and send effects. So you could do that very easily here. So let's say if I wanted to take a stereo file here and if I wanted to add, you know, effect send, you know, if I wanted to add just like a little bit of reverb, something you generally don't do in mastering, but But if something's really dry and you're trying to create ambience of a recording. So let's say maybe you want to like... So you could do that. A lot of people wouldn't ever choose to do that, but you know, if you want to do some some different mastering, you know, check out like the frequency EQ is pretty amazing because if you want to go to your EQ, you could see frequency. And this has this little function here. Where you can auto listen for filters. So if you're looking for very specific frequencies.
So look for like the frequencies are annoying and then just And here you could also have, you know, mid side. So if you wanted to EQ only the middle part of the panning spectrum. And let's say you want the sides to be the edges to be a little brighter. So, you know, that's a, a great plugin, you know, also just doing like, you know, running it through limiters, multiband compressors will kind of all get you to where a lot of people want to go for mastering. So we, there's lots of people that master inside of Cubase and Nuendo. It's the same audio engine. Uh, but, you know, WaveLab, what it's going to do is it has a very specific master rig plugin. It's going to allow you to write to multiple files simultaneously. So different file formats. If you need to do a 32-bit, 384K, 2496, it's 2448, 1644 one, and AAC... You could kind of just do batch encoding. There's more metadata that can be accomplished uh, with WaveLab and some more extensive metering. So, but you know, if you're just kind of doing some processing, you could probably get by in Cubase. But you know, check out what's going on in WaveLab as well, because it's kind of a dedicated mastering tool. All right. Okay, just reading through some of the comments. Thanks for all the great questions. And if you've learned a new tip or trick, please feel free to give a thumbs up to the Hangout. All right. Okay, uh, which folders on a hard drive are essential in doing a backup of your Cubase workstation? Uh, okay, the project folders, obviously, but what about custom settings, presets, VSTs? What I would do if, you know, for all those types of functions is just come over here. If you go to your edit menu, go to your profile manager. And this will be like all your user settings, your user presets, your preferences, your key commands all those different things that you've set up, just save those. And that's kind of, if you're migrating from one computer to another computer uh, quickly, that, you know, that's an easy way to be able to handle that is just going to your profile manager. And then like, especially if you're working at a friend's studio, you could just simply take over your profile on a thumb drive, uh, load it up, restart Cubase, and then you don't have to mess up any of their preferences or key commands or vice versa if they come to your studio and you've modified and changed all your keyboard shortcuts. You, so the Profile Manager is a great tool for being able to, to take all those little user settings that you've created to archive. Okay, um, so could you please show how to do a tape stop effect on main screen? I've just upgraded from Cubase 7 to 10.5 and I can't do it via process. So a lot of times if you're doing like kind of tape machine style, like tape stop effects, you know, you could check out um, one of the ones that works really well for this is gonna be on, you'll see it under other, it's called loop mash FX. So in, what this is really good for is you could do stuff like and you could actually just play this in real time by MIDI or just automate the plugin. So say I just want to do a tape stop here. And then as I play back. See the automation come up here. So, you know, check out the loop mash FX and then you could just automate it or play it. You know, basically add a MIDI track. Uh, and then once you have loop mash FX, you could have the output go to uh, Loop Mash FX, and then you could just actually just play the different uh, effects there for tape stops, and you could do it in real time. All 
Okay, so we see Philip French checking in from Grand Prairie, Texas. Been there many times. One of my good friends, Tony Esqueda, lives there. So just outside Dallas. And he's wishing all the happy fathers day to all the dads. It's great. It's really nice. All right. Okay, so question, when I finish a session, how can I duplicate the same session with all my tracks and plugins, but without any of the information of the MIDI tracks or audio tracks? So if you want to come here, we could just say you want to import tracks from project. So let's go ahead and choose a project here. So I'll choose this, and then as we do this, um, I can say, let's select all the different events, uh, all the tracks that are in my particular project and I'll uncheck events and parts. So now I'll come over here, hit okay. Uh, it's going to now import everything in there without any of the actual parts. So no MIDI, no audio, but all the track settings. So again, go to file to import tracks from project select it and just uncheck events and parts and then you could kind of migrate all that data over okay so um so see question hi greg how to make a soft calm chord pluck with cubase with stock plugins uh, I'm not sure what you mean by soft calm chord pluck, but maybe like maybe a guitar type thing. So let's just see if we can. Okay, so let's just see if we can go through some of the maybe in high and sonic SE. So maybe if you could send more information what you want for uh, like a soft chord calm pluck but you could try some of the nylon chords here and there's also different finger picking patterns that you could have So I can just play a chord and it'll arpeggiate for you. So, uh, so, but maybe if you could specify, we may not be able to get to it, but if you want to email me kind of like or is like maybe a link to a sound example of soft calm chord plug that'd be helpful okay okay you go through um so I see question anyone know how to consolidate a midi region so maybe if we have like say if we have MIDI parts that look like this. That are separated. And I think if I wanted to, I could select those. Um, and then I think if you go to bounce MIDI, that that will make it into one event. So if that's what you want to to consolidate like multiple tracks. Uh, let's see if we can do it without selecting it. Um, so just select the events that you want and go to MIDI to bounce MIDI.
Um, so I see, hi Greg, your great hangouts are very much appreciated. Thanks so much to learn. Do you plan some kind of catalog of all the topics you already covered all in one place with links to the hangout? You know, we tried it. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, we make sure that we have all the, the topics indexed. I think Ted Spring, Springwoods or Springman uh, may have sent me a file that was kind of like uh, all the questions linked to that. Um, and he sent it maybe four to six weeks ago. So I'll see if we can maybe get that posted somewhere. Um, so but I, I, I will see if, if we could kind of consolidate it in a different, more kind of searchable format. And then maybe someone at Steinberg could do it. Uh, from all the hangout questions so people could have a reference to it. Okay. Okay, so it says, uh, I have the new Cubase. I also have Absolute 4. My problem is with Tribework, Dark Planet, Hypnotic Dance. There's no presets in those plugins. So a lot of times if you're running the absolute four, sometimes you may, you know, I've seen sometimes people like only have like when I come here, I, I, I could only access like, I think how I installed it maybe from absolute collection. Um, so when I come over here, let's say to like a Hallian Sonic SE and I start, um, I see all the different, you know, when I want to come here, I could see tribe work and, hypnotic dance, you know, just listed here, then I could see all the presets as opposed to being a standalone program. Um, if you see it as a standalone, what you could try is go into Media Bay um, and then make sure that you have this left window, like the direct the file browser here, and try going into uh, like VST3 presets and see if you know you could you know if you click here just to rescan the disks so you may see these under you know and then that you may see some of the different you know factory content start to show up here but try going to maybe uh we'll try let's see if the tribe work is here this is going to be effects plugins um, yeah, but try going under like, you know, VST three presets and try rescanning media bay and see if they show up, but you should see them if you just do it within Howling and Sonic SE as well. Okay. Let's just go on. Okay, so let's just kind of move on to some other questions here. Let's see if I... All right, so let's take my timeline, jumped again. Okay. Reading through different comments. Um, thanks for all the great comments from everyone. Okay. Just reading through comments again here. Um, okay, so hi Greg, uh, how can I extract different MIDI notes from a chord to a single track, like in a brass section? All right, so let's say if I have, let me just generate a couple chords here quickly. Just add a chord track, It'd be a little easier. I'm 
just turn my snap on here. Okay, so I'm just going to drag these here. Let me just erase this. Okay, so if I wanted to So I have these chords. So I think we can do this with a logical editor. So let's go to your MIDI to logical editor. Um and then we could choose to extract. And I say I want to say the type is equal, let's say context variable is equal to lowest pitch. Or we could actually choose um, number of note position within a chord. And so let's say if I want the lowest note within a chord, um, so as we do this, I'll hit apply, and that will just take the lowest note within a chord and extract it out for you. So uh, under function, choose extract. Uh, under filter target, context variable. Condition is to equal, uh, and then you could say note within number of notes, uh, you know, position in chord part, or number of notes within chord, number of voices, note number within chord, and think zero for the lowest note one, for the second lowest note two, three, et cetera. So, and then just hit apply and that should automatically just extract it and put it onto its own voice for you. Okay. Okay, it's just kind of going through comments. Thanks for all the great questions. Okay, just seeing some other comments. Okay. Okay, so just going through. Just seeing comment, the video engine in 10.5 works great. Yeah, I think it's they did a good job with that. Okay, so I uh, see from Gareth K Music. Uh, hi, Greg. Question: Which DAW multi fader controllers would you recommend for Cubase? Um, you know, if budget isn't a limit, I think you know by far the most you know deeply integrated is going to be the uh, you know the Yamaha Nuage. Uh, I mean, that's it's so incredibly well implemented and integrated that that that's a great choice. Uh, and I realize it's out of budget for a lot of people. Um, I know a lot of people, you know, depending on if you want like real mixer faders for like, you know, driving a mix console, Mackie controls are still very popular. You know, I know even, you know, I've seen Stevie Wonder with a little $199 Behringer controller for, you know, his writing setup, you know, that works fine for him. Uh, so a lot of people use that. I know a lot of people kind of like the, it was an icon QCon control, which I think is based on Mackie control. 
a lot of people really like their Nectar controllers uh, and find that that's a good balance of a MIDI controller and being able to do stuff for driving plugins. So it could really, you know, some controllers will be better for plugins, some would be better for mixing, and some could be better for editing. Um, so it could really depend, you know, but I think if you're just doing mixing, like a Mackie control is really good. If you're doing, you know, I, I use a CC 121 a lot. I have a Houston controller. I don't use as much cause it doesn't fit on my desk anymore, but I, I still have it off to the side, but I tend to use a CC 121 for a lot of stuff that I don't necessarily find myself like in the old days of, you know, I'm tracking, I'm editing, I'm putting on my mixing hat that I'm finding that, you know, I'm mixing while I'm tracking and editing. So I don't need to have 16 faders at once uh, because I'm kind of doing it throughout the whole process, just doing little automation bumps here and there when needed. So I think that I still love my CC 121 controller um, but you know, it depends on what type of functions you want a controller for as well. Okay. It's just going on. So th thanks for all the great discussion and comments. Okay, so it says, uh, hi, four out of five times render in place renders all tracks together, even though separate option is on, happens on more than one system. Cubase 10, is this a known bug? Uh, I haven't run into that uh, with render in place. I've generally found if, I, if there's a render in place, a uh, problem that it's generally kind of whenever I've had an issue with it, it's generally kind of uh, when I use the current settings, when I need it to kind of perhaps tweak a little bit. Um, but if you have a project and you want to send me or just like an exact uh, description of what's going on, um, you know, you could, you know, you could email me at uh, clubcubase at uh, steinberg.de. So, um, so, and always make sure that, you know, you don't have mixed down to one audio file. And it also could depend on if your, you know, render in place could be different if you have the tracks versus events selected. So that's something else to be, uh, cognitive of as well. Um, so I see a comment, I can't find the channel latency. So if you go to the full mix console, and you come over here, make sure that you have the channel latency control. And then as you have plugins and different different elements here, different tracks, you can kind of slide over. So as I add, let's say an insert here. That you could see the channel latency here. So let's say if I wanted to, so as we add a couple inserts, then when I go to my channel latency, you could actually just kind of click there and see exactly how much latency each plugin is causing. But if you, you need to see it in a full mix console, I think this came in version 10 as well, but make sure you have channel latency checked right there. Okay. Uh, so you see question, uh, will the spectral layers hang out beyond this channel? I think it just might be on the Steinberg, uh, on the main Steinberg channel. So I don't think it's going to be on a Cubase channel. They try to keep stuff, you know, Cubase oriented stuff on this channel and more general Steinberg stuff, I think on the main Steinberg channel. So I think it's going to be on the main Steinberg channel. And if you can't find a link to it, uh, you can send me an email to clubcubase at steinberg.de and I'll be happy to send you a link. And just seeing someone else mentioning that their system renders fines, but make sure you have all the relevant tracks and events selected. Okay. Okay, just reading through your different discussions. OK, 
Okay, some other people helping out with the channel latency. Okay. Okay, so just see um, question, how can I download Cubase 5? Well, Cubase 5 is about 11 years old, so you should, uh, you know, try, you know, getting Cubase 10.5 from your dealer or from the Steinberg online shop. Okay, just going through... Okay, so just see a comment. Came to Cubase from S1. Salute from Chicago. Good to see you online from Chicago. Been there a zillion times for work over the years. Used to rep that area way back when. Okay. Okay, so uh, we have a question. How can I arrange the inserts list? Uh, my inserts are scattered and would also like to get rid of the ones I don't use. So I, I'm the, if this is just a kind of, of a general question on like plugin visibility and management of plugins, what you could do is just go to your studio menu and go to VST plugin manager. And here we could, uh, you could create a new collection. So I'm going to copy the current collection. We'll call this June 16th. Hang out. And then once you're here, you say, like, I don't use this plugin. I could delete this plugin. I could delete this plugin. You could make your own folders and be able to, you know, have the plugins organized exactly as you want with the VST plugin manager. So you could have different, uh, you know, plugin collections. And this is what I want for MIDI. This is what I want for tracking. This is what I want for mixing. And do, that way, the other plugins, like if you did the, you know, typical Black Friday, you know, 50 plugins for 25 bucks and you use three of them and you don't want to see 47 of them again, you could just simply... Uh, you know, hide those plugins for your views that are not in your way. Okay. Okay, so I see question uh, with those uh, preferences tr settings translate from Mac to PC. Yeah, so you just kind of drop it in the same folder. So no problems there. Okay, uh, so we have a question. Please point me to any resources for mixing saxophone. I play sax, but when I record, it sounds thin or artificial. So it's good to take a look. I think I have a jazz track that we could play around with. We heard the two track of earlier. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look. So I think we have saxophone here. So here it's kind of recorded as being dry. You know, it's a lot, a lot of times try not to make sure that you don't have a lot of, um, you know, a lot of EQ on it. So it's often subtractive EQ. Where it could sound hard, you know, a bit harsh and artificial, like when you push EQs, maybe. And here we're just using just a little bit of reverb. So now, if I just want to put on the reverb. So sometimes often just less processing. 
can give you a little more. You know, sometimes cutting out a lot of low frequencies can make a difference as well. But when stuff, you know, when I hear something like an acoustic instrument sounding unnatural, it's, you know, it could be because people are using too much EQ, too much compression, or too much reverb. So try just to dial back on your processing and, you know, your saxophone may come to life. Uh, so Greg, uh, so this is a great question. Hi, Greg. Is there a cure for Cubase addiction? Uh, I'm not joking. Um, yeah, it reminds me of a great quote Paul McCartney had. I think it was in Rolling Stone magazine where he was saying that, you know, it's like, oh, he just loves sitting down with his Cubase. And before he knows it, like eight hours have gone by and his wife has to come and kind of tap him on the shoulder and told him that he wasted a whole day, you know, playing with Cubase, but he just can get like so enveloped in it. So, um, I don't, I'm not sure if there is a cure. I mean, it's really engaging, create creatively engaging software. So I've been kind of addicted to it for, you know, it's almost 29 years myself. So it's, it's, uh, you know, and I'm still learning new stuff. So it's, um, there's worse things to be addicted to than Cubase. So, but you know, just getting stuff that you want and once you're in that creative zone and, you know, I like, one of the things I like about Cubase also is like you think maybe you've gone down this path that no one else has and you realize that the whole time that there's some developer who thought of that whole path and gave you that exit out and has a little trap door for you when you need it so that you could, you know, get your creativity realized. So, um, so, but I'm not sure if there is a, a cure for it. So, but you know, we'll just try to make great music and be happy. Okay, so uh, I see Taylor wasn't able to make it to the last session, but I can't find the video for June 12th in search or in the Cubase page. Could you direct me to it with a link? Uh, Taylor, if you want to email me, uh, I think I have your email address, but if you want to email me just as kind of like a brain cramp uh, email reminder, um, sometimes they go through and give it a name of one of the topics, um, but, you know, afterwards so that it, there's some metadata to look through. So sometimes uh, you could look, but I could find it for you. Um, and we could just uh, have that actually, uh, I could send you the link to the last Hangout. Okay. So just seeing more discussion on the microphone for the saxophone being critical. So uh, you know, like ribbon mics always work really well. Um, sorry, my timeline jumped again here let me just toggle back so some people discussing like you know different ribbon microphones like Royers are great um, so you know a, a great saxophone and a great mic is always a good combination and seeing kind of uh, always the stable recommendation of a U87, so Neumann, so those are always great. All right, see so comment from Taylor, just bought a new UR22C, haven't hooked it up yet, but I'm excited to be able to record in 32-bit format. It's a great little interface, so that's what I use for all my travels now when I when I used to travel pre-pandemic. So, but yeah, it's a it's a great little interface. I think you'll love it, Taylor. Just seeing a comment. Uh, thanks, Greg, for being so patient with us, uh, Cubase users, and our questions. You know, we I was at the same point. You know, I, I probably every question that's been asked, I had at one point too. So I'm glad to be able to share knowledge and help people out. Um, okay, so we see can Cubase control minimum and maximum MIDI CC values? So let's take a look. I think we could probably do that through our um, input transformer. So let me just add an instrument track here quickly. 
So we see this little squiggly line and we could set this up for global or local. So if I want to activate, um, and what this will do is kind of transform incoming MIDI data. So let's say I only want, um, let's say type is equal to a controller and I want value one of that controller to be, let's say modulation. And what do I want to do with that? I want to take uh, value two and let's say, Let me just see if we could. Let's see, value two is we could set uh, inside of range, let's say 50 to 100. Okay, so I will come over here and just record modulation data. I'm just going to move my mod wheel up and down here. So I'm going kind of the full value and we'll look at our modulation data here. So I think if we come over here, it looks like that kind of worked. Um, try to set it up. like this and you could set kind of the range and here we could choose to filter. Let me try filter. So now I'm gonna move my modulation wheel up and down. So I would try that. So see if you come over here to um, local that you could set up your controller one just to do a particular modulation and see if you could filter it within that particular range. And I think that'll do the trick for you. All right, so let's just move on to next question. Uh, so uh, I see question, uh, where will I put tape saturation in my plugin chain? It could really go anywhere. A lot of people like to run like the entire mix through tape saturation. So if I wanted to come here, so if I come here, I go to my mix console, I'll just put on my master fader. So a lot of people put on the master bus to try and keep everything glued. It also can be put on each individual channel in a channel strip. So if you want it for kick or bass, you could do that as well, just from the channel strip. Okay, just reading a comment, just noticing one weird gooey thing. Uh, windows are square, but the graphics inside are all round corners. What's the use of it? Um, it 
could be, you know, we have a guy that just really concentrates on all those kind of user interface things. So I don't, to me, it doesn't bother me, but I, but I'm not sure if there's a, you know, it might be just an aesthetic design decision. Okay. So, um, says, how do we work with volume automation on audio clips? So, you know, really there's a couple of ways of doing it. One is to, you know, we could just select a particular clip here. I'll just, let's choose this clip. And if I want it to, let me just get, uh, do events to part. Okay. You know, there's several different ways of doing. So if I have a clip here and I've split it, I could grab just my volume automation here. I could do that. I could grab a pencil and draw in pre-fader volume. I could also just go directly to automation. So if I click in the lower left-hand corner, so this is pre-automation. So it's really helpful for maybe regulating particular tracks. But if I want it to go over here and just, you know, automate particular tracks, I could click here to open up the automation lane. We could draw that in, or we could just select a particular range. So if I undid that, and let's say I just wanted to make this louder with volume automation and be able to curve and do different Bezier curves. We could do this as well. So you could just kind of come here. And then if I really like that particular pattern, you could just duplicate. And this would automatically tie directly into the mix fader. So there's just a number of different ways of doing, kind of changing the volume in automated manners with Cubase. Okay, so we have a question. Hi, Greg, is there or will there be any way of renumbering the tracks inside the mix console? I use SoftTube's console one controller and it could be hard to navigate. Um, I think, you know, the mix console that we see here is going to be kind of tied directly to uh, the values here. So I don't think there's a, you know, this would be kind of, so if I move this track, which is 14, and I move it to, 11, you know, we can see that that automatically gets renumbered. So, um, so I don't know a way of renumbering other than just kind of taking the particular tracks and moving them. Okay. Okay. So I see when is CB 11 pro out? Um, you know, we just released 10.5 about, you know, six or seven months ago. So, you know, it's usually if you look at the cycle and pattern of things, you know, I think the Germans are pretty good at sticking to patterns and release dates. So, um, but it's not out now, it hasn't been announced. So. Okay, so question, hi Greg, is it possible that when I select a track in the mixer to get the view scroll focused at the track to get the to seeing if okay so is it uh is it possible that when i select a track in the mixer to get the view scroll focused uh focus that track in the project window so i think as soon as you select a track here it's automatically selected in the project window so, um, so I'm just saying, so you select track and mixer to get the view scroll focused. Um, I, I think, let me just see if there's a preference maybe that turns that off. So maybe if you have a scroll to selected track off, let's see if that.
that seems to So it seems like uh, I'm not sure maybe I'm misunderstanding but it seems like that uh this track selection is in sync but maybe uh if you could let me know if I'm misunderstanding Okay, it says, hi, Greg, I have a Scarlet Solo Yamaha R16 interfaces and a Sound Blaster card. Is there any way to set up a control room to use all three devices? They all have different drivers. So generally not. Um, so when you have, you know, when some people have tried using ASIO for all to accomplish that, and that gets to be problematic in a lot of different ways. Um because there's not a unified clock between those three devices. So when you're dealing with a digital audio workstation, you want to know that when you send audio out to be processed, that the clocking between different areas is going to be consistent. And there's no way to have consistent clocking between those different interfaces. Um, and also to get these latency issues. So I would try to, you know, if you're doing it on... I assume with the Sound Blaster card, you're on PC. You could maybe try the ASIO for all, and then you could pick the different devices, but that tends not to be so reliable. But generally, I would try to use a one audio interface that has all the ins and outs that you need. Okay, so we have a question. When I mix down a project, the mix down is exported on a higher pitch. Is this a bug? It happens occasionally. So generally when you do that, that means when you do an export audio mix down that you will see that the sample rate mismatch. So you may be working at 44.1 and maybe when you exported the file, it was exported at 48K. So generally when it's a higher pitch, that would indicate probably a sample rate mismatch. Uh, so question, what is the most convenient way to swap tracks on a PC to Mac and vice versa? There's really, you know, however you want to, a lot of people do Dropbox. Some people use VST Transit, which is uh, one way of doing it, or like different cloud. I know people do Google Drives or WeTransfers or use Thumb Drive. So it's really, you know, if you are paying for like a cloud service, you could use that or, you know, or, you know, what they used to call sneaker net, you know, which is just someone taking a drive over from one computer to another computer, you know, so depending on how big the files are. So, uh, but I think, you know, a lot of people use USB flash drives to migrate projects or upload it to like a cloud-based uh, system where you could share. Yeah, but there's nothing really special that has to be done. Okay, we see Gareth has left the Hangout. All right. Okay, so I just see a uh, comment. Uh, not that many tutorials on spectral layers. Can you please show uh, some details? Sorry, my... Let me just, um, sorry, my timeline jumped on me. Uh, not that many tutorials on spectral layers. Can you please show a few how to's? So, you know, we're going to have a dedicated spectral layers hangout tomorrow. Um, so maybe if you watch that, you could ask questions of Mike. So check that out. Uh, if you want to email me, I could send you the link to the hangout, but look on the Steinberg channel as well and then so there's going to be one tomorrow so i don't want to steal any of mike's thunder with that okay uh question track and vst quick controls are they universal or project specific any tips on setting them up importing exporting etc so um you know setting them up like to drive them is is going to be universal and that's what we can set up in our track quick controls and our vst quick controls so if i want to go to my track quick controls and just click on learn i could move 
my fader here. So let's say my Nectar controller. I'll just move my controls like so. Okay, so let's say I have those as my controls. And now when I go to my VS, and this is the part that could be project-based, but you want to make sure that you have your quick controls active. And now that these are active and turned on, I could just control those different parameters just that easily right here. So you could do that. So once you have them kind of set up, you may have to turn them on in the project, but you only have to, but the setup here would be global so that when you go to our project, your controller is automatically kind of mapped for you. Okay. Uh, Question uh, from the Netherlands. Hi, I have a question about export audio mix down. I would like to have the locators inserted automatically in the audio file name. Thanks. Um, so if you have like the, let's say like the cycle marker, perhaps, uh, what you could do is when you go to your file to export audio mix down, um, you'll see this little settings cogwheel here. And then you could have different functions for, you know, you could have like the channel name, let's say the project number, the counter, uh, and then you could have different, uh, you know, separators for, you know, counters by digits. Um, so you could have a number of different options for settings within the naming conventions. So check out the naming conventions here in the export audio mix down. And if you have cycle markers, you could have the cycle marker name or the site or the uh, marker name. Um, so seeing our comment, um, are you twenties? Okay. About microphones for sax. Um, all right. So we, all right. So question, can Cubase retain wave metadata when imported from sound miner? So I know a lot of people use SoundMiner directly for, you know, finding like all of your sound effects. Um, and I believe that Cubase reads just about all of the metadata. So as soon as you jump here, you go to your file browser um, and navigate to your folders that m I think about 98% of the metadata is, is carried through. I don't have a SoundMiner uh, license or setup. So, but I, you know, I know a lot of people that use it with Nuendo and they don't seem to have a problem being able to drive everything directly from Media Bay. Okay, so in Studio One, you can set a track to be stereo or mono. The effects, insert effects to become either mono or stereo. Is there a similar function in Nuendo to switch a track between mono and stereo? No, it's kind of fixed uh, settings, you know. So, um, but if you want, you know, if it's a mono track and you put inserts in, your inserts would meet the channel configuration. And uh, when you go to sends, you could have different channel configurations for sends. So like you have your sends in stereo and your tracks in, and you have your, you know, your sends in stereo and your inserts in mono to match. Okay. I see someone else mentioning that the uh, June 12th hangout was how to remap drum sounds from one instrument to another for Taylor's benefit. Okay. So I see uh, in the old Cubase and Atari, the function keys was a neat trick when mixing drums. I missed that. Uh, if you could re remind me, maybe Wayne, what the uh, function key was, or what the function was. I think most of the stuff from the Atari is still in there from the drum editor. Okay. Uh, see so in our comment, Greg, I want to thank you again so much. Today will be dedicated to your input. So glad, to hopefully, the Hangout's helpful. And if you've 
learned a new trick, please feel free to, uh, you know, give a thumbs up. Okay, so it says, uh, May 16th, I asked you to show how to use a MIDI keyboard to replace existing notes in the score editor. You showed uh, another editor in the live stream. I, um, I emailed you after the live session, but I didn't hear back. I missed some subsequent live streams, so maybe I just missed it. I think we did it in the same Hangout later, but we'll go ahead and show it again. So let me go to a particular part here. Yeah, I remember like doing it twice in that one particular hangout. So it might be shortly after uh, within the May 16th hangout. But let me come over here and let's do it within the score editor. Let's try just different project here. Sorry about that. Okay, so when I come here, if I wanted to replace notes uh, just directly, um, I would just come to the note replacement option here. So we go to the MIDI step input. And now as I would play notes, and let me just zoom in here. I'll just play a different pitch on the MIDI keyboard. Let me just try starting from a new part maybe here quick. Okay, so I'll just All right, let me put in my correct Okay, so let's say if I have some of these notes in and now let's choose just to replace the pitch.
Let me see if I need to be in page mode. So now I have page mode, so now I'll just kind of hit different pitches. So I have the MIDI input and I have just a pitch turned on. Let me just zoom here. So I hit a different pitch. And that way you could navigate back. So say I want to go to this particular note and I'll just put in different pitches. So again, I have the MIDI input enabled and so that's how you kind of do it to some very similar way that you do it in the key editor as well. Okay. Okay, so just see a comment. Uh, I've been using UR22C for six months. Liked it so much. I got in yesterday the UR816C, hooking it up today. That's great. Uh, it's a wonderful interface as well. I wish I had one, so I'll have to get one. Save up my money, get one. Um, Okay, let me just, my timeline scrolled way ahead again. Bear with me, sorry. Okay, we'll go through some more questions. Seem to be doing okay on time. Hope everyone's learned a trick or two. Um, all right. So it says, Hey, Greg wondered if there is a way to break a piano part into a set of four voices to break it into soprano, alto, tenor, bass lines. So let's go ahead and, um, give it a try here. So I'll just do a quick, um, we just go back here and I'll just input some different chord voicings won't make any sense and then i think if you go to the scores here uh maybe under functions choose explode uh then we could say to new tracks and hit okay that each of these will now be split to their independent tracks. So try, when you go to the score editor, once you have it selected, try going to functions and choose explode. Then that should be able to split out to like an SATB for you automatically. Okay, so question, when I split my project window and open the lower zone, my SPL only shows on the top part. Is there a fix for that? Um, Okay, so just um, so when I split my project window and open the lower zone, okay, so let me just go to another project here. Okay. 
Okay, so let's say I think maybe the split means a divide track list functionality. Okay. Um, so I split my project window and open the lower zone, which is open here. Uh, my SPL only shows on the top part. Um, I'm not sure what the SPL is. Is it the metering? So, so, uh, so let's see when we split my project window lower zone. Um, so I, I'm not sure what the SPL is. Um, so maybe if you could email me what the SPL is that you're referring to. I'm not sure if it's the meters for the, the sound pressure levels. Um, but yeah, if you could specify that, that would be helpful. Okay. Um, Okay, so you see a question, uh, how to route three different output channels to one compressor. So if I wanted to take, you know, my uh, piano, guitar, what you could do is just kind of take uh, these particular tracks and send it to a group track. So you could add a group track to selected channels. And on that group track, just run the compressor. And then all three of those tracks are now feeding the compressor. So you could send it to a group and that group apply compression there. So that way you could take three different output channels and feed the same compressor. Okay, so let's just go on. So seeing some weird comments, kind of spam-like. Um, okay, so. Um, okay, Greg, can you recommend a Steinberger Yamaha mixer that I can use to hook up old hardware and use it along with Cubase 10.5? Can you also please recommend a broken microphone work well with Cubase? Um, so if you have old hardware, you may not need a mixer. You know, I would get an audio interface that uh, has a lot of inputs and outputs, like the UR816 is good for that. And if you go to your audio connections, we could choose just to go to and create external effects. And you could connect these into your audio interface and then be able to access them like a plugin. So you may not need a mixer. Hang on, my son is knocking on the door. Bear with me just one second.
All right, I'm back. Sorry about that. So, um, but yeah, so if you have an older audio, inter you know, if you have an interface, you know, try with enough inputs and outputs, you could hook up your outboard gear directly to that. Um, so, um, and also the second part of the question is, can you please recommend a broken microphone that works well with Cubase? Um, you know, I think there's a lot of great mics on a market that are cheap. You know, that's one of the things that's changed significantly since I started recording many, many years ago. Um, but I know a lot of people, you know, really like kind of some of the road mics. Uh, I've always had great luck with, with road mics. So, okay. Okay, so question, why does note stretch in Vario Audio stop working after you set a tempo definition? So if you set a tempo definition, you may just have to, um, so let's say if I set a tempo definition here for this particular file, um, let's take a look. Um, so I see I have my vocal tempo defined at 75. Um, and we go to very audio and at this point, you know, as soon as I go to stretch a particular note, it seems to be working. Uh, but if you have, you know, you may, depending on other edits that you have in a file, you may want to just choose to flatten the file before you do very audio or just do a bounce selection, you know, duplicate the file and bounce selection and see if that makes a difference. Okay, so uh, can we turn a WAV file into MIDI, at least bass and drums? So we showed the drums earlier but if you want to take any uh monophonic audio such as a bass part uh let's take a look i think we could look in this project here just revert this So if I wanted to come here to the bass part, uh, I'll go to Vary Audio, have it do its analysis. And then once that's done, we can go to Functions and choose to Extract MIDI. And now once we've done that, it's created the MIDI part of our bass right there. So. You can do it for monophonic audio without any problems. So, okay, so I think we see more of a clarification of. Um, Okay, so it says divide project window with marker track and core track on top and audio clip or MIDI track in the bottom, open audio clip. Uh, in lower zone, song position locator only shows in the top half. So let me just, so I have a marker track and I'll add a chord track to the top. Okay, open audio clip or MIDI clip in the lower zone. Okay, it's done. Uh, song position locator only shows in the top half. So here I see the song position pointer playing in the lower half and the top half here. Let me just, so I have the divide track list enabled and I see the song position kind of playing as expected. Okay, so we have another question, is it possible to use multiple audio interfaces at the same time? You know, generally it's kind of shied away from because of clocking issues. Um, so you could do it you know, on Mac. It kind of supports it a little bit at the at the operating system level, uh, but you know it's going to compound latency and it could lead to clocking problems.
Okay, uh, so Greg, so how should I import mono stems and insert stereo effects properly uh, if I want the source to be dual mono? So, you know, if you want something to be dual mono, like let's say if I want to do dual mono compression on the bass. Um, so let me just... Uh, so, you know, I'm not sure why you need to have stereo effects as an insert, you know, but if you wanted to, you could, uh, you know, if you wanted to come here, um, let's say if, if it was based on a stereo track and you want to do dual mono, you could come here. So let's add a stereo track. And if you wanted to treat things as dual mono, you could add, let's say, com you know, compressor. So we'll go to our compressor here. And then once we're in the particular channel, you could come over here and just go to your routing and you could choose that you want it to be mono, that you wanted this to be mono and open up different routing editors to choose exactly which ones that you want to be linked so you could have independent processing. Okay, so a question, what is the actual output main bus, output stereo, out mono out, not a MIDI instrument or audio track? Uh, so what if it's the actual output main bus, output stereo, mono out, not a MIDI instrument? Okay, so. So I'm not sure if I understand that question or if it's a follow up from earlier, so. Uh, all right, so question, um, if I extract a MIDI file from a vocal line, will that give me the vocal melody line then? Yes. So once you do uh, the MIDI, you, you could just simply, um, yeah, have your vocal line and be able to print out notation for that particular part as well. All right, so I know some people had sent some questions in and we got through some of them. Let, let's go ahead and take a quick look. Um, Okay, so we kind of did performance. We did, um, okay, so we had a, a question. This is kind of regarding Dorco. So I'm encountering a problem I can't really find answers to on Google and was wondering if it could be addressed in the next Hangout session tomorrow. Uh, it's regarding exporting from Cubase. I'm going to Pro 10 to Dorco, more especially drums. I write my own drums in the piano roll using Superior Drummer 2 and Whenever I want to export my drums as MIDI to import them in Dorco to prepare my score, I always get only the snare and kick, but no other elements, sometimes a hi-hat and tom, but it's random. I tried to create a map in Cubase, but it didn't work. Could you show how to create maps or do this in another way, especially with plugins like SD2, where several MIDI notes can correspond to one instrument, like hi-hat openings? Um especially since my drum lines are quite complex. I don't see myself uh, rewriting everything from scratch in Dorco uh, and the drummers I hire need scores. So if you're doing this in Dorco, it's the solution is to create a drum map, a uh, percussion map in Dorco. So if we wanted to come over here, I'll just open up Dorco really quickly. So to do your Darko drum map, um, if you go to the play mode here, uh, and then go to percussion maps. And here you may just have to click on the plus symbol and create the percussion map for the uh, Superior Drummer 2. So I think that there's, from what I've read online, that people had, um, kind of worked a lot with an easy drummer map that's kind of available um, and then modified that for Dorco to work with Superior Drummer 3. So you may want to Google that. Um, but you could also ask one, one of the Discover Dorco sessions if you have a hard time uh, coming up with the drum map. But you want to create that drum map 
uh, inside of Dorco. Okay. Question is emailed in. Can you recommend team viewer help between Cubase users solving questions within Facebook groups? Can you speak about risks and bad things as a concern while using team viewer? Do I give team viewer help to anyone sometime fixing Cubase issues? I do a lot of stuff with team viewer. Um, so I use a lot in consulting and helping people. Um, you know, the one thing, you know, make sure that, you know, if you're doing team viewer that, you know, if you're watching the person, you know, it's like, I, you know, someone could be nefarious and maybe go into financial documents or something like that. But if you're there, you could always kick them off if you're watching it. So, but yeah, I do team viewer consulting all the time. So it's, um, so it's, it's pretty common and, you know, it's pretty easy and there's no real downsides as long as you're watching. A uh, question is sent in. Uh, will Steinberg include a gain reduction meter in the mixer working with third-party plugins like other programs in future updates? I've kind of seen it on uh, some discussion. I think it's been in surveys for user features. Um, so that's always a pretty good indication that we might see it in future versions, but I can't really comment. Um, they usually don't tell me what's in future stuff because they know I talk to people all the time. Um, but I think that was on the survey, so that's a pretty good indication. Uh, and our question, some third-party plugins don't work with the AI knob, the CC121. What is needed to make it work, and can it only be done by the developers? It's generally up to the developers. I think what the AI knob mimics is basically the mouse control wheel, so if you could hover over parameter and increment and decrement values using the mouse control wheel. That's kind of what the AI knob does. So I know some plugins don't work with it and it's really up to the plugin developer to just re to have that functionality, but it's common and in like, you know, 98% of plugins. Okay. Let's go through some more questions that were sent over. Okay, so we have uh, still dealing with the issue of effects bleeding through when I have a channel routed to a group and I pull down the group volume so you can still hear the channel effects playing. Uh, makes doing reggae dub almost impossible if I link multiple tracks together. Is there any way I could change one keyframe and it will change them all? So let's take a look. I think we could look at it in this song. So let's say if I do the horrible thing, I'll select uh, all of my tracks here in the mix console. And I'll just send them to a reverb. All right, so let's say I'll just accentuate this. And let's say I have all my drums going to a group. So I'm gonna add a stereo group to my drums. So I think if I just mute Just check this. Let me just make sure these are being sent. Okay, some of these aren't going through the group, so let me just route this to our group. Sorry, missed the routing there. Okay, so now they're all going into the group. So I'm not sure if you tried, I think, I know we discussed this before, but if, maybe if you just mute the group, that that kills, but if you drop the volume, you may still hear the reverb bleeding through. So I'm not sure if muting the group is an option for you, but I would try that. All right, 
So let's see if there's um, other questions that were kind of sent in. I think we got most of those. We did some mastering tracks. Um, okay. Okay, so let's go back to the live feed and go through a couple more questions and we'll start wrapping up. Okay, so um, okay, so uh, I see a question. Can we extract a polyphonic keyboard from a mixed wave file that contains the whole song? Currently, no. I mean, there's some things that try to attempt to do it, but I haven't seen anything that's been consistent and worked well especially on anything complex okay uh so it says hi greg how can i control every parameter from channel strip processors by midi with external midi controller so if you wanted to you could set up you know different uh track quick controls parameters so if you wanted to come here we could just say i wanted to go to my channel strip for you know different functions so as i have a channel strip open for this let's say if i come here i have a noise gate compressor and you could have different presets that will allow you to kind of so as soon as I wanted to come here, I could say this this will be when I go to my channel strip, I could say, okay, here's my noise gate parameters, here's my tube compression. So you could have, you know, different quick control patterns to control via MIDI all the channel strip settings. Okay, let's do a couple more minutes and we'll wrap up. Okay, just make sure, see where we're at question-wise. Okay, so I think I'm at the bottom of the questions. We'll see if there's any last minute questions. If not, we'll wrap up maybe a little early. All right, so it looks like maybe another question popped in. Okay, um, so I guess I think i am reached the end of the questions for once. I know we missed some. Um, so I guess we'll go ahead and start to wrap up. I want to thank everyone for all the great questions. If you learned something new, please feel free to uh, give a thumbs up. Uh, we'll be doing another Hangout on Friday. So look, uh, probably starting at the same time, uh, 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern. We'll try to have the index posted later tonight. Um, and if you have questions, you can send them in advance to Club Cubase at Steinberg.de. Check out the Spectral Layers Hangout uh, tomorrow. You could also take advantage of the Nuendo promotion that's currently going on, celebrating 20 years of Nuendo. So you could do that. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone for great uh, questions. And I hope everyone's learned something. And I want everyone to please stay safe and healthy. And uh, we'll go ahead and... Uh, feel free to, you know, send the questions in advance and we will see you on next Friday. So we'll get wrap up. Thank you so much. And thanks for all the great questions. Goodbye.